Hi, I'm Carlin Borisenko. In early 2020, I was the knitting Democrat who accidentally went viral on the internet for going to a Trump rally and then left the party. I became the conservative darling, was on all the shows, traveled around the country, and then realized that conservatives were no better than Democrats. If there's one thing that I've learned, it's that both political tribes are two sides of the same coin. But it wasn't all bad. On my journey, I became obsessed with understanding the woke ideology and the culture war. I broke the story of the city of Seattle doing segregated training with its employees. How bad has this stuff become? The city of Seattle has now put out, I'm not kidding you. This is according to Dr. Carolyn Borsanko, who's an organizational psychologist. The city of Seattle asked its white employees to voluntarily spend a day off in a training about their internalized racial superiority. I broke the story that led to the first ever federal lawsuit against critical race theory in the schools. I broke the Coke Be Less White story, one of the biggest anti-woke stories of all time. It got over 30 million views. Coca-Cola's corporate headquarters even had to change their outgoing voicemail. Throughout the past few days, you may have seen inaccurate reporting on the content of our recently launched diversity, equity, and inclusion training program. I exposed the schools in Burlington, Vermont for grooming middle school children live on the internet. They called me an unwoke cult leader for that and the Vermont Human Rights Commission slandered me publicly as being a hate channel. I even got called a hero in Breitbart for exposing that the Washington Post was writing a hit piece on Christopher Rufo. I have broken story after story after story about what's going on in the public schools, from Cambridge, Massachusetts, to autistic sex education, to the Department of Education in Michigan, literally training teachers all over the state how to groom children. I wrote a book called Actively Unwoke, the ultimate guide for fighting back against the woke insanity in your life. I host a podcast all about fighting back, and I'm downloading all of my knowledge to you on my Substack, carlin.substack.com. The world is a crazy place. We are literally surrounded by cults on all sides. On this show, we're going to do a deep dive into all aspects of the culture war, and I will show you the dark dystopian underbellies on both sides. Here are the commitments I'll make to you. I will always tell you the truth. I will always bring you receipts. And if you stick with me, I promise you will see the world differently. Welcome to the cult. Please mount that like button for me and subscribe if you feel so inclined. Well, hey, hey, everyone. Happy Thursday. Welcome to The Cult. The Cult is a show that I stream Monday through Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, where we watch some of the most insane and unseen training that you have seen on the Internet. We watch whiteness training. We watch equity training. We watch queer training. We watch trans training. We watch teacher training. We watch all the different trainings that show you what's actually going on in the world, what's actually being taught to the people teaching your kids and all that good stuff. And we've been focusing in this week on the University of Michigan, not Michigan, Minnesota. Minnesota, the home of the Black Lives Matter riots in 2020. And apparently Minnesota, we are we are learning, is becoming just as woke as places like Colorado, just as woke as places like Seattle or Chicago or Portland, Oregon. I don't know about extra. I, w- I was feeling rather I was feeling rather dark and mysterious today. I was feeling I was feeling moody. So like, like my lips look like I'm wearing lipstick, but it's not. It's just like, this is the only lip gloss I could find, but it ends up looking like I'm trying to wear makeup and be a girl. Who knows? So we've been focusing in on, on the University of Minnesota and we had been watching for the past couple days, some trainings that were done by a center that is run by the diversity, diversity director at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And those trainings were fine. They were very cringe, and we got a couple more to watch. But I did some digging around the University of Minnesota website today, and I I want to show you guys what I found. Oh no, I'm wearing a T-shirt. Ah! I wouldn't want to look sloppy. I'm wearing both a T-shirt and a hoodie. Oh my word! Well, maybe that's the intent. The high priestess of the socialist left. Everyone clutched their pearls simultaneously. Um, so I did some digging around the university yet yeah, <laughs> demonic. <laughs> 
Totally. I did some digging around the University of Minnesota website, and I want to show you what I found. Check this out. Come on. Show it. That's not what I... No, that's not what I wanted to show you. Wrong screen. Wrong screen. Wrong screen. Hey, God. Hey, God. This is what I wanted to show you. No, not that one. This one. Hang on. Queer X. Now, we have been watching trainings over the last couple of days from the University of Minnesota Duluth. So that's like one of these smaller kind of offshoots in the University of Minnesota system, right? But this is not the University of Minnesota Duluth. This is the University of Minnesota proper. You can tell because of the URL. And this is the se- the Gender and Sexuality Center for Queer and Trans Life, which is dun, 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 a unit of the Office of Equity and Diversity. And their education and training programs are called Queer X. And if you go into this Queer X website, you all of a sudden start to find videos. Our identities matter. Queer and trans indigenous people and people of color. Non-binary and gender non-conforming identities. LGBTQIA plus sexual violence. Queering sustainability. Isn't that interesting? And this is my favorite one on the Queer X University of Minnesota website. Non-monogamous relationships the university of minnesota the the taxpayers in minnesota actually funded a training for students at the university of minnesota about how to have the best non-monogamous relationship that you can have and i think we're gonna watch that one tomorrow for happy hour because I I want some drinks if I'm going to watch that one. <laughs> but uh, basically finding this website led me to their YouTube channel. Now, these are things you all... This is pro tip, guys. This is how you find all these little university center YouTube channels. Is you go onto the university website. You go find their queer studies or gender studies centers which are usually buried in their website. And then you find videos. And when you find the videos that are posted from their YouTube page, you click on the video and it goes to YouTube because that's how these things work. Look at this. This this queer and non-monogamy thing. And then from there, you find the YouTube channel that only has nine subscribers. This is the the YouTube channel. Oh, shit. That's not what I wanted to do. Jeez, I'm crow. There we go. This is the YouTube channel for this Gender and Sexuality Center for Queer and Trans Life. These are the types of YouTube channels that we live for. Nine subscribers, basically no views, has been dead on YouTube forever. Official taxpayer-funded thing, though. And it's got all these, it's got all these videos. It's got all these videos and all these trainings that we can watch over the years. Now, they started this stuff six, seven years ago. Can we just wrap our heads around that? Six or seven years ago. This is what happens when people don't pay attention to what's going on. This is how they get away with everything. This is how they take over institutions without you even knowing what they're doing. So I decided we were going to watch the most recent live one, which is from a year ago. And the thing we're going to watch today is from the fifth annual Andrea Jenkins lecture. And it's called Towards a Non-Binary Future. So we've talked uh, extensively about queer Marxism on this channel and about how the goal of queer Marxism is to abolish the gender binary. Queer is different than trans. Queer is different than gay. Queer is not about who you have sex with. It's not about who you love. It's not about the genitals you have between your legs. It's not about your gender identity. It's not about any of those things. Queer is only and exclusively a far left political ideology that is designed to destabilize the system and attack capitalism by abolishing the gender 
binary. That's all it is. And so when we're talking about towards a non-binary future, I think that's a pretty explicit kind of title describing what they want. I've been telling you guys this. What they want is not to abolish men, is not to abolish women. They want to abolish all gender entirely and create an entire world of non-binary. And they tell you this explicitly on the University of Minnesota website. I got stuck in the uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul airport overnight after Christmas, and I slept in one of the art areas, and I watched a video presentation about certain Minneapolis or Minnesota residents. It was insane. I do have to say, the Minneapolis-St. Paul airport is actually pretty great. I have no complaints about that particular airport. it's, It's so disappointing to me because I actually love the city of Minneapolis, okay, when it's not cold. Minneapolis is a great food city. It's a great walking city. It's got a lot of cool cultural elements. It's got a lot of good beer. They've got good public transportation. I never, like, some of the best food I've had, and I've traveled a lot, and I've eaten in a lot of good restaurants, some of the best food I've had in the country was in Minneapolis. There's a restaurant called Devil's Kitchen, or at least there was last time I was there. Best breakfast I have ever had in my life. Anyway. So this is is what we're going to watch today. Towards a non-binary future. The Andrea Jenkins Lecture Series at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, is an annual lecture that honors Andrea Jenkins and works to to center the voices of queer and trans people. This series was created in 2017, but a da da da. Not really much about the uh, the content of the lecture on here. Oh, except we do have an agenda, and we're gonna have to skip ahead a little bit because I want to get I want to get explicitly into. There's also some volume issues on the stream but we'll skip ahead a little bit uh through the the preamble and go right to the lecture but that's what we're watching today guys it is a two hour long stream but i think we're going to start about a half hour 45 minutes into it so hopefully shouldn't take us that long i'm not going to read all the bios that are really small because i can barely see them even with my glasses on i can barely see them that's what we're doing today guys i hope you're here for it please do mount the like button if you have not already and make sure you're subscribed on whatever channel you're watching on. Again, I stream Monday through Friday at 5 p.m. On Saturdays, we go live at 6 p.m. for Socialism Saturday. We got a great Socialism Saturday coming up this week. We are getting kicked off with a brand new Sophie video. Brand new, about four months old, I think. So how, how else could we start the year but with a Sophie episode of Socialism Saturday? We just had to. Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing on Saturday. I'll tell you guys a little bit more about that later. But before we get into that, just a couple more orders of business. Do make sure you are subscribed to my Substack, which is Carlin, K-A-R-L-Y-N, dot Substack.com. I am putting the finishing touches on a little flow chart that is a little bit like this one that I made over the break. I'll pop that in, in the chat if you... Uh, haven't seen it yet. There you go. There you go, Rumble. And so I'm working on, so I made this giant flow chart or mind map over the break to kind of show people how, uh, how race, gender, queer, and family are all interrelated in the language of socialist. And now what I'm doing, and I was hoping to get it done last night, but I didn't, it's just the way it goes, but I will get it done tonight. Um, is I'm making kind of like a mini flow chart for like each of these sections. So right now I'm working on one to explain explicitly why whiteness means capitalism. Because if you can wrap your head around the idea that whiteness has nothing to do with skin color, it only and exclusively has to do with the system of capitalism, that's like the biggest hurdle that you have to overcome in terms of learning how to speak socialist and learning about the coded language. And once you overcome that hurdle and you extricate from your brain any idea that whiteness is related to skin color, because it is not, Black people can be white, let Latinx people can be white, Asian people are actually considered white. They're considered having ascended to whiteness. You have to just get rid of any notion that this has to do with skin color at all. And once you do that, 
you will understand the left on a whole new level. So I'm working on a little mini flowchart to really lay that out in as plain English as I possibly can. So we're going to have that resource. The only place you're going to be able to find that is going to be on my Substack, which again is Carlin, K-A-R-L-Y-N dot Substack.com. And again, I do hope to have that up later on today. So if you want to make sure you are notified when it comes out, uh, please make sure you sign up for a subscription. You can subscribe for free. Um, but if you want to support the work I'm doing and keep me in business, because I can only do this with your help, with your support, with your funding, because you guys are the ones that that pay for my time, essentially, to be able to do this, please sign up for a subscription for $8 a month or $80 a year. I really do appreciate it. Tayton says, queer cannot be white. That's correct, Tayton. Very, very good. Queer cannot be white. I should like put that on a t-shirt or something that like, or like make some sort of graphic with that. That would fuck a lot of people's heads up if I'm honest about it. Hang on. Let me grab a screenshot of that. So I don't forget. Queer cannot be white. Everyone knows why that is, right? Everyone, does everyone know why Tayton is saying queer cannot be white? Everyone know? Let me know in the chat. While you're over on my website, I want you to make sure you're signed up for my live training, How to Speak Socialist, which is going to be on January 24th at 9 p.m. Eastern time. So that's coming right up. If you attended my training last year, uh, I am going to have new clips and a little bit new content. It is going to be a little bit of a review for people who attended last year or people who come to Socialism Saturday on a regular basis. But if you have friends and family that need a good introduction, or if you're new to me and you're new to watching Socialism with me, then this is going to going to be a really good crash course to help you understand the language much, much quicker than you might be able to do it otherwise. So I definitely recommend it. It's totally free to sign up for. You can find the link on my Substack, and I just popped it in the chat. I put it in the chat, I think. Yes, I did. So make sure you're signed up. If you can't make it for the live showing, you will get a recording emailed to you as soon as it's ready within 24 hours, essentially, of the uh, training being done. I will lay out all of the things I showed you in that flow chart earlier. We will watch clips of socialists saying these things. So you don't ever have to take my word for it. You never have to trust me. I will always bring you resources to show you what these people are saying so you can hear for yourself and you can decide for yourself what you think. You can sign up for that now over on the Substack. Also want to remind everyone that if you another way to support the work I'm doing is by heading over to the Unwoke Art Store and picking up some sick merch that you can't get anywhere else. And of course, right now I do have a very special, two very special limited editions for January actually because the copyright has run out on the original Mickey Mouse. I've got our Steamboat Willie uh, Whiteness Means Capitalism t-shirt. You're only going to be able to get this for one month. It's only going to be in the store through the end of January. And so if you want kind of like a fun way and a little bit of a subversive thing to wear to uh, teach people why whiteness means capitalism, you can only get that in the Unwoke Art Store on t-shirts, on hoodies, on all sorts of cool stuff. You can even get, actually, this is the hoodie that I'm wearing with not there. The Unwoke Art logo on the side. That's what it looks like on the front. This is the actual one I'm wearing. I very rarely make these. I only made this one as a special one for myself. I've never actually sold these in the store. Now, on the back of my hoodie, I have the actual Unwoke Art logo because I wore this for Pork Fest last year. But I made a special one where on the back of it, where is it? There it is. We've got the uh, the Mickey saying whiteness means capitalism. So you're like a walking billboard. I got to tell you guys, you guys see me wear this on stream. I wear this hoodie all the effing time. I love this hoodie. I thought you guys might like it as well. And so, uh, so that's going to be a limited edition that's only going to be in the store for a month. You can get it on bags, tank tops, mugs, stickers, plaster that sticker everywhere. I think I'm also going to do... Um, I think I'm also going to like just release the image and have it be printable so people can print their own stickers. And what I would really like to do is I would love for people to print their own stickers and then go around their town or around their community and like subversively like plaster that stuff everywhere. That would be a really fun project for us to do. It's like slap a picture on like a, a light post or like a crosswalk sign or something near the schools or things like that. Don't get arrested, of course, never get caught and then take a picture of it, post that on social media. Wouldn't that be a little bit of a fun, subversive project for us to do? I think that'd be great. 
Another thing you can get right now on the Unwoke Art website, and this is only for the next couple of days, is you can get 24% off the Plague Doctor designs that I have. So we've got the Be an Anti-Hero design. This is a brand new design in the Unwoke Art store. It's part of my signature series, so it will always be in the store. And it's got the cool uh, bronze Plague Doctor. Uh, or maybe it's like more of like a brushed kind of like nickel. I'm not exactly sure, but it looks cool. And it says be an anti-hero on it because the Plague Doctor is going to be our mascot for this year. And then we've got the limited edition Unwoke Wiki design, which is for a new project I'm doing. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that, not tonight, but another time. And on the front of it, it's got the, the badass Plague Doctor design. I'm going to be doing a new Plague Doctor every single month for the Unwoke Wiki website. And on the back of it, it says the socialist revolution is real. Visit us over here and you can see the primary source documentation that we are collecting from all of this. So that is all available in the Unwoke Art Store right now. Both Plague Doctor designs are 24% off for the first week of 2024, but that only lasts through this weekend. So you got to get it before Sunday because that discount is going to go away after Sunday and it's going to be regular price. So you might as well get it for a little bit off and get a cool a cool piece of merch or a gift or something like that. And of course the proceeds of this do go to support the work I'm doing and I greatly appreciate it. All right. With that out of the way, let's, uh, let's get this party started. Again, guys, please do make sure you mount the like button for me. There is a shocking disparity between the number of people who are watching and the number of people who have mounted that like button. Guys, YouTube bans me to high heaven. YouTube shadow bans me to high heaven. I can only get unshadow banned when people participate and click on my content when it's served to them and mount the like button. It doesn't cost you guys anything to do this. I hear all the time people want more people to see my content. Well, I can't control that, guys. You are the only people who can control that. The only thing I can control is showing up and showing the videos and talking about them. I cannot control who sees my content and I certainly can't control it when people don't mount the like button or subscribe to the channel or click on videos when they're shown to them. This is a team effort, guys. I can't do it without you. And still, I have a shocking disparity between the number of people who have mounted the like button because that's just uh, that's just the way it goes. That's just the way it goes. Anyway, let's get this party started and we're going to find where the lecture actually begins because it's not right away. Multicultural student engagement, the office for diversity inclusion in the college of food, agricultural and natural resources sciences. This is like welcoming stuff. Five, 50 years. Um, There's a panel at some point. Okay, here we go. I think we're getting into the panel now. Okay, okay, okay. Trans awareness. Hang on, what is that? Kink? Why did that say kink? Extra, oh, this is this is the bio. Okay, they're reading their bios, so we should probably listen to this. Okay. I think we found it. Um, oh shit, I have a couple super chats. Hang on. I'm sorry. I didn't even I didn't even see the super chats. Sorry guys, let's do the super chats before we get started. I demand AI art of Stephen Hawking's watching naked midgets doing math. I don't know if I can make that though, because I don't know, I don't want to violate their term. I don't want to do that. Poor Stephen Hawk. Let let the let the man have an orgy, okay? Let the man have an orgy. He's had a tough life. Beth says, did you get your mindless Sons of Anarchy and Vikings binge over Christmas? No, I didn't. I didn't get it at all. I was watching bad internet reality TV instead. I could have been watching, I could have been watching handsome men riding motorcycles or being Vikings. You know what's funny though, Beth? Victor fucking had a Vikings marathon over the holidays. I think he heard me talking about watching Vikings and then Victor's like, I'm going to watch Vikings too. Because he, Victor was the one that introduced me to Vikings in the first place. and uh, But I was watching it for different reasons. Because I was, I was watching it for the men. Also, it is actually a really good show. But no, I did not get my Vikings marathon over Christmas. I didn't. All right, let's, let's focus. 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 I am really excited to hear from our two guests tonight and so i am going to ask ben to come back and introduce our featured speakers tonight 
Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Andrea. It's always a joy to hear some of your own work performed as a part of this, this series. Um, it is my excitement and honor to introduce our featured speakers tonight. Of which Why would I come to Texas? Why would I do that? Give me a good reason and maybe we'll see. Which we have two. So I'm gonna read both of their bios and then welcome them to the stage to be in dialogue. Yosenio V. Lewis is a Latino of African descent trans man who has been a social justice activist since he was 13 years old. That means a socialist. A consultant, health educator, speaker, trainer, facilitator, writer, performer, out poly and kinky person, and a spiritual what? blogger. Yosenio has been a panelist in keynotes. An out poly and kinky person. Okay. I need to spread my word around my work around Texas. Well, we'll see. Can I do that virtually from New Hampshire? We'll see. I do. Okay. To, to be serious, I do actually want to get back into speaking this year. I used to do keynote speeches like all over the country. That was what I did before the pandemic. I would actually like to um like, like go out there and do like the, how to speak socialist training um and stuff in person. And I just haven't, I just haven't started like marketing that yet. So if you have groups that will bring, listen guys, if you have groups, that want me to speak about what I'm doing and to show people what I'm doing, either virtually or bringing me out somewhere in person, let me know. I'm willing to do it. I can definitely talk about it. Um, but but if you guys want to fund me going places, make sure you subscribe to the Substack. It's the way it goes. Like either your group's going to pay to bring me out or you guys are going to fund my work through the, the Substack or whatever other ways you want to fund my work. But uh, that's the way it goes. speaker at numerous universities and sexuality conferences. He was one of the inaugural honorees of the Trans 100 list. Yosenio is a board member of the Alternative Sexualities Health Research Alliance, also a board member of the Columbia University, Emory University, San Francisco State University Project Affirm Transgender Resilience Study. Oh, good. And a member of the Association of Black Sexologists and Clinicians. Black Sexologists? Yesenio is a certified restorative justice practitioner and has completed the Introduction to the Principles of Kingian Nonviolence. He's on the faculty for the Sex ju Justice Track of the National LGBTQ Task Force Creating Change Conference. Wait, 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 wait. He is uh, on the faculty for the sex justice track of the National LGBTQ Task Force. See, we always find out when we watch speeches like this, we find out so many different interesting organizations. LGBTQ Task Force. Oh, shit. Hang on. I'm looking up this up in another browser. LGBTQ. I know bot's busy, so I have to do this myself now. Uh, conference. Oh, what's this? What's what's this? Hello. Hello, lover. Hello. Does anyone want to go to New Orleans? You know what's funny about this? Do you know what's funny is I literally just said to Victor the other day, I was like, we should go to New Orleans because I love New Orleans and the food in New Orleans is so good and the culture in New Orleans is so good and the art in New Orleans is so good. I fucking love New Orleans. Does anyone else love New Orleans? Come on. You don't get better oysters in the world. That's what like Victor and I went out and we got like oysters because like oysters are the best. And I was like, the best oysters in the world are in New Orleans. And that's not the only thing in New Orleans. Apparently, on January 17th through the 21st, there's a Queer Power, Queer Action, and Queer Joy Conference in New Orleans. Join the nation's foremost political leadership and skills-building conference for the LGBTQ plus movement at the Hilton Riverside in New Orleans. Huh. Huh.
$625 to register. We'd also have to get hotel. We'd have to get airfare. Let's see. What 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 is this conference about though? Like, well, I mean obviously I know what it's about, but I want to see a I want a schedule. I want a schedule. What are they teaching at this conference? Hmm. What are they teaching? Look, look at that. They're wearing masks. Where's the schedule, though? Do they not have a schedule? Do you just show up? About? Schedule! Jesus Christ. Bi plus caucus, hey sis, labor, call all sorts of caucuses. Radical Afrocentric wellness and empower sex liberation and performance art, transformative justice explanate exploration for trans masculine and masculine. I could I I well that's for it's for BIPOC though. I can't pull off BIPOC. I can pull off trans masculine. I can't pull off BIPOC. Unmasking school censorship, crafting powerful messages for LGBTQ plus inclusion. Y'all, y'all means all justice work in creative climates. <gasps> Anti-capitalist personal finance 101. Are you shitting me? There's an anti-capitalist session at the conference. Reclaiming power and wellness, resourcing equity. Crafting our LGBTQIA plus narratives, trans demand, shifting the narrative on anti-trans violence. Our gender, our drag, our lives, fighting anti-trans fascism. Seriously, though, is anyone in New Orleans? Art of Connection, Ballroom. Oh, Yasmin loves Ballroom. Forging non-binary and trans-masculine BIPOC leadership. Chemsex, queering harm reduction in a PNP. What the hell does that even mean? Out in education, connecting with LGBTQ plus youth. Sex and pleasure in an aging queer community. Creating rest distance, decentering whiteness within the nonprofit sector, decolonizing spirituality. These people can go fuck themselves. Dismantling the master's house, race, electoral systems, and power. Ever querying the story and exploration of trans and religious leadership. Wow. This is like. Seriously, is anyone in New Orleans? Does anyone does anyone want to sponsor me to go? I'll go. I'm not being disrupted. I'm not I won't be disrupted, but I'll go. If anyone on the internet wants to sponsor me to go to this conference, please get in touch and I'm not actually joking about that. I would need probably about $3,000. Probably about that. Because it's a $625 registration fee. And then, where actually is it? Do they have an official hotel? They have a YouTube channel. Oh, oh, did we just find, did we just find a whole other treasure trove of videos? I think we might have. Hilton is a sponsor. Did you see that? Are they a sponsor? Is that just the hotel? 
Where's the hotel information about sponsors? Triple A is a sponsor? Com fucking Comcast. Hilton, you're right. Hilton is a sponsor. Act Blue, that's a Democratic fundraising. Planned Parenthood. The United Church of Christ. Wow. But where's the hotel? <laughs> I just, I want to get, like, I'm serious, though. If someone wants to sponsor me to go to this, I bet it's going to cost around $3,000. What I would need is, I would need airfare. I would need hotel. And we're talking about, let's say, like, you know, whatever, $250 a night for the hotel. And it's, and, and I would have to get there. I think it doesn't really. Okay, so I'd have to go on, on the 16th. So 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20, 21. I would need basically a week in a hotel. So that's going to be $250 times seven, $250 a night, roughly. I don't know. Register hotel. Okay, hang on. Oh, you're right. Look at that. Is there an attendee rate? I need to go on the 16th through the 22nd. Okay, so $200 a night. So what that's going to be like 1400 Yeah, Yeah, so around $3,000 is what I would need. So if someone wants to sponsor me <laughs> to cover this conference, so there are two ways we can do this. Either... I can get, let me do math. Let's play, let's play a game called fun with math. If so, if I need $3,000 divided by $80 for the annual membership of my Substack, I would need roughly 40 people. I need 40 people to sign up for a fucking annual membership on my Substack. Or I need one person to donate $3,000 or I need 30 people to donate $100. Can we actually make this happen? I mean, I'm talking about it live on the internet. This is not actually my most stealthy of infiltrations, but... Or I would need like like don't don't donate via super chat on YouTube. They take thirty percent. If people are thinking I can give you super chats, I like the inclination. I do. YouTube takes thirty percent of the money. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna put this out into the universe, and I'm gonna say if this is meant to be, this is meant to be, and this is why I ask people to sign up for the Substack because. Quite frankly, I right now with the Substack don't have the resources to do this because I did not meet my goal in December for new paid subscribers. Now, if I had met my goal in December for new paid subscribers to the Substack, I would already have this funded. I want people to really understand this. This is why I tell people that if you want me to do more investigative journalism, if you want me to go undercover at things, if you want me to show you what's going on at these events, I'm more than happy to do it, but I can't pay for everything out of my own pocket. It costs about $3,000 to cover an event like this. And so if, if people had signed up and I had hit the goal last month, like I begged and pleaded with people to do, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now because I could just fund this, but they didn't do that. And so, well, I'm not funding this, like merch costs money to produce, Sarah. The, 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 I'm, no, no. The merch is like, is like extra, but I can't fun things based on merch because it costs it costs money for you guys understand right when you buy a piece of merch i have to pay to produce that merch i have to pay to ship that merch like that's not the best way to do it i 
I don't want to set up a separate give send go. I don't like here's the thing. I fucking don't want to set up a separate give send go for this. I just want people to subscribe to the goddamn sub stack. I don't know why this is so hard. Well, okay. I am putting it out there into the universe. I will go and and attend this and learn from these experts. These amazing experts on queer power and queer action and queer joy. Because as we know, guys, I am, I mean, I am, I am, I am polyamorous and, uh, and uh, pansexual on the internet. So I'm basically queer. So this applies to me too. I have an internet boyfriend and an internet girlfriend and a husband at the same time. I'm polyamorous and uh, pansexual on the internet. And so I'm queer too. So this applies to me. No, well, this is this is the this is this is the problem. This is this is why I get so frustrated with this stuff, Beth. You shouldn't have to. You shouldn't have to. This is why I have begged and pleaded and cajoled people to understand that if you want coverage of stuff like this, it costs money and it needs to come from somewhere. I cannot just give it out for free and then pay for it myself. You shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to keep going to the well with the same people over and over and over again. Over 10,000 people a day read my Substack. I don't know how to I don't know how to get people to get this. I really don't. Anyway. Well, now we know it exists and if people want to see it then they can fund it and if they don't want to see it then they don't have to and I just won't go and that's just going to be the way it is. Let's go back to our lecture. of the National LGBTQ Task Force Creating Change Conference. He is a trans patient educator at Stanford University and has been featured in several documentaries about gender identity and the trans experience. He is the founder of Written in the Flesh Erotic Readings, an onstage opportunity for lifting up people of color voices in erotica and sexual liberation. Yesenio is also an aspiring voiceover artist. He believes that there can be no art without activism and no activism without art. Roxanne Anderson, known very well to many of us who live in the Twin Cities, is an award-winning community activist who has been working in social justice and service for 30 plus years. Rox believes vital, vital, visible transgender leaders of color make our- Hang on. No, Beth, no. You already do enough. No. Listen, if people don't want to fund this, then it's just not going to happen. I don't want it to come from the same people over and over and over and over and over again. It's taking, like, honestly, it makes me feel, it makes me feel, Beth, it makes me feel extraordinarily guilty to go back to the same people over and over and over and over and over again because other people are not stepping up. I appreciate it. You're 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 a good woman, Beth. I really and you've always supported my work, but it's just like at some point either people care about this or they don't, you know? Community is stronger. Roxanne has been honored with many accolades including the 2022 Legacy Award, the 2018 Bush Fellowship, the Stellar Award for Outstanding Transgender Adult of the Year. Can we just acknowledge what a fantastic award title that is? The Beautiful Humans uh, Award for the work of Rare Productions in LGBTQI2S media for its coverage of cutting edge and emerging POC artists. The University of Minnesota's Community Excellence Award, Lavender Magazine's 100 Fab Community Organizer Award, Twin Cities Black, Pli Black Pride Community Service Award for Diversity and Inclusion, Twin Cities Grand Marshal, and Rox was, has been featured in Curve Magazine, Rolling Stone Magazine, and many other publications for community leadership. Currently, Roxanne is the director of, the pro, of programs of the Minnesota Transgender Health Coalition, the co-founder and director of Rare Productions, a multimedia arts and entertainment company focusing on producing and promoting queer artists of color, and is the co-founder of Our Space, 
an LGBTQ com community center startup for Minnesota's queer community. Rox is a skilled and highly sought after facilitator. Their topics of expertise include LGBTQ identities, kink and sexual liberation, creating safer More spaces, kink. building racial equity, mental health first aid, cultural competency, trans awareness, allyship, strategic planning, organizational development, and business startups. Lots of expertise in the room tonight. Anderson is on the board of directors for Southside Harm Reduction, Minnesota POC Pride, Twin City Spectrum, and is on the core team for the City of Minneapolis Trans Equity Working Group. Roxanne is also a Reiki practitioner. Rox loves art, playing music, taking pictures, and has been an on-air DJ radio host for 25 years with shows on KFAI and KRSM radio stations. They enjoy swimming, fishing, riding their scooter to Chala, AKA the Black Panther. Rox lives in South Minneapolis, the original ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people with their partner, two pit bulls and some chickens. Join me in welcoming to the stage, Roxanne Anderson and Yosenio V. Lewis. God, this is so solemn walking with their masks. All right, hey everybody. Jesus. We are oh, back. Hell no, I flew 8 billion miles. At least it's loud. <laughs> or 2,500 or something like that. So At least we're not having a volume than... challenge. Let's do it again, Ron. Two, Give 20, us a big 22. warm welcome. <laughs> oh, stop. You guys don't have to do all that. Stop it now. Wow. Well, what what a deep honor to be uh, sitting on the stage with you guys for the the fifth annual um, Andrea Jenkins lecture. It, it's just an amazing um, feeling to to be able to invite friends mm -hmm. to the University of Minnesota to just talk about their lives, about their hopes and dreams, the challenges that they've been through, and to be able to put a couple of chips in their pocket while they do it, because that's what we have to do as community. Lift each other up and turn each other out to opportunities. Right. That's the work that I've been trying to do. And I know that's the work that you guys have been doing because I've been working with both of you um, on so many issues and projects over the past 25 years from HIV and AIDS, mm -hmm. activism to uh, justice for CC, right. um, youth development training programs, um, healthy sexuality. Does anyone want to guess who is going to say capitalism first? Is it going to be contestant number one, contestant number two, or contestant number three? Please, uh, please register your votes in the chat. Is it going to be the first to say capitalism, contestant number one, contestant number two in the middle, or contestant number three on the right? I mean, we've been getting some surprises the past couple of days. All right, everyone has registered their guess. The the issues abolition abolition uh, the issues go on and on, and it's so amazing to work with you two because. The work is always intersectional. It is never about one 
identity, never about one issue. And that's why I thought it would be great to have the both of you here to talk about non-binary identities and how that is manifested. It's something that's seemingly new to a lot of community, but I've known you both and both of you have been steadfast in that sort of in between space for a very, very long time. So yeah. Talk to me about non-binary identity. Well, I, I think first I would just say thank you very much for, you know, having us. It feels like a great honor to be able to share the stage with both you and Yo Senio as people who um, have been leading in this for a long time before like trans was trending. You were doing the work. Um, big thanks to Finn for setting it up and sending the emails and texting and reminding to fill out the WTs, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that, yeah, for me, that, that line of um, never quite conforming to the check boxes around race or gender or sexuality or really anything, um, to be able to talk about that in a public way and to share the stage with legends feels like kind of dreamy for me. And I'm supposed to follow that. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Academy. Where's Chris so I can slap him? <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, enough of that. How, how am I supposed to, I'm not a legend, I'm just somebody who does some work. Hi, I'm Yosenio, um, I'm from California. I'm here to talk with you, to talk with my peoples and to be in a space where I in no way, shape or fashion have to compartmentalize myself. Mm. I don't have to say, oh, I'm only supposed to talk about gender when my gender is informed by my skin color. My gender is informed by the language I speak versus the language that my family speaks. My gender is formed by so much of the rest of me. And I'm finally happy to be at a place where I can bring all of it. Because mm. that's rarely the case. You know, people ask me to come and speak and say, oh, we want you to talk about this thing, but can you tone down you know, that race stuff? Or can you tone down the, no. <laughs> Because when you see me on the street, you're not toning down the race stuff. You're looking at me, looking at my face and saying, I can trust you. I can't trust you. Let me run across the street. Let me lock the door. Let me clutch my purse a little harder. Let me do whatever I have to do to protect myself. Because looking at you, I see someone that's a threat to me or that has been purported to be a threat to me. And so I most, must act accordingly. So how in the world can I separate all that out when I come and speak to you? How can I separate that out when it's all a part of me? So no more preaching. I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy to be in the, in the space with two wonderful, amazing people. And I'm really happy um, to actually be somewhere other than my little room, mm -hmm. which I've been in for two years now. I think about that commercial of, the woman who's tenderizing the meat. And, and I'm assuming that's her partner who's saying, oh, we got the tickets, everything is set for the vacation and we can cancel if we need to. And she just smashes the computer and says, nothing will stop me from my vacation. I haven't gone anywhere in two years. Well, I really haven't gone anywhere in two years. Uh -huh. And so it's nice that my first trip on a plane and my first trip anywhere is here. So thank you for having me. I loved the weather when I came in. You guys are probably sick of any kind of snow, but I loved the little bit of snow yeah, we, we over, got yesterday. We over the snow. <laughs> we over the snow, you. Yeah, but you got to live in it all the time. I just get to visit it and say, oh, my God. Thank God I'm leaving. No, <laughs> but no I, I really did. I really enjoyed it. It really was another way for me to feel 
comfortable and feel kind of home. I used to come to Minnesota, well, to Minneapolis in particular, um, many, many times when I was walk working with Andrea and Dr. Bokting on the HIV programs here at the university. So I know a little bit about the place and I know how wonderful all of you can be mm -hmm. and how wonderful you cannot be. So <laughs> I just, I have an affinity to this place and so I'm happy to be back and I'm happy to be able to talk about non-binary futures, although I don't really know what that means for me. Um, I know what it's like to be in a place where I'm constantly being questioned about, am I this enough? Hmm. And also questioning myself because of the reactions that I get from people. And I think I'll just let that sit for a moment and then come back and say some other miraculously wonderful things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I picked the, the piece, Pink and Blue, to share tonight because I think it kind of speaks to the dual nature of um, maybe a non-binary identity um, and some of the challenges that that can present when um, in dating or relationships. Do either of you have any thoughts around how, how do you navigate um, relationships in, in that kind of liminal space, maybe? I mean, I think for me, it's, it's just become a matter of being kind of choosy, um, choosy about what spaces I go to, um, choosy about the company that I keep. Um, and I think that that's been a little bit of just, you know, pendulum swinging, right? Figuring out um, who your people are. Um, that's, that hasn't been the case so much in my, in my current relationship, you know, we have to figure out people, right? We have to have an understanding of who they are and things like that. Um, in 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 a past relationship in in like one of the first dates we went on it was summertime it was hot um and i was wearing an a shirt that kind of showed my cleavage a little bit um and that person said why are you showing your cleavage oh wow um because i'm presenting in a masculine way um my cleavage perhaps made them uncomfortable or maybe they just weren't um as used to seeing you know then way back then butch people um you know kind of wear their cleavage out um and so um i have a lot of it um and so you know sometimes i like to show it off um and but but after that i know what happened to me is i felt self-conscious yeah. like the, the next time i got ready to go out i think i probably put on a shirt over my a shirt so you allowed someone else to bit. impact your um, sense of and, self and instead of until just, you know doing what you I wanted to do that like that's their stuff and it's hot and it only is hot for a few months here in Minnesota. So you kind of have to like take advantage of it. Um, and so I think, you know, it's just been this kind of pendulum of swinging um, both for myself and, and having an understanding of what feels good. And so sometimes I don't actually know until I know it doesn't feel good. Um, here at home, I am often not misgendered. People are often using my pronouns and recognizing me for who I am. And when I step outside of my little queer bubble um, and I hear people refer to me as she, it feels weird. Um, and so- Yeah, it feels weird when I hear people refer to you as she. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's just a matter of like, oh, that that doesn't feel right. 
So now I have to figure out something different. Mm -hmm. My gender journey started when I was three, because I was three years old and I knew I was different and I knew I got way too excited when people mistakenly called me boy. Mm -hmm. My pivotal experience was with my best friend at that time, who, with whom I did everything. We played all, we're three years old, what do you do? You play. So that's what we did, we played a lot. And one time we both had to go to the bathroom at the same time. So we did, because we did everything together. We went to the bathroom, pulled our pants down. He started peeing and I was just thinking, I'm gonna do that. And I thought, but I don't do it like that. And then when it was my turn to pee, I looked at him again, because for some reason he hadn't pulled his pants up. He was a little braggart even then. And I was certain that there was something wrong with me, mm. like physically, medically wrong with me that I needed to go to the hospital right then. So I proceeded to have a huge panic attack and say, Bobby, Bobby, we have to go to the hospital. Something's wrong with me. We've got to go. We've got to go. And he said, what? What? I, not, what are you? Why? And I said, because I look different from you. And this is why he was my best friend. He said, sometimes I take a shower with my dad and I, I looked at him and I don't look like him. So I said, daddy, how come I look different? And he said, because you have to grow and you have to, when you grow, you're gonna look more like me. So then he turned to me and I don't know, I don't know how he knew to do this. He put his hands on my shoulders and said, it will grow. <laughs> <laughs> now you have a three-year-old who's your best friend who says wow. it's going to grow and has the evidence of his dad saying yours is going to grow because mine grew and so yours will grow when it's time when you get older i just said okay cool <laughs> panic attack went away and we went out and had a great time now remember we're three years old so it didn't sound anywhere near as clear as that it was i thought it was a, it was a, it was a daddy but this is about the how could you grow and that was enough for me. And I spent a good 30 years after that. It's going to grow. It's going to grow. I'm not worried. It's going to grow. Didn't quite grow to where I wanted it to grow, but it did. And it was enough for me to realize <laughs> that incident and several others wait, were wait, terrifying wait, moments. Wait, 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 wait. Did he just confess to having a tiny dick in a, in a, in a lecture at the University of Minnesota? Did that, I don't think we've ever, I, I mean, we've seen a lot of stuff in these trainings before. I don't think we've ever actually heard someone confess to having a tiny dick. And this is why he's non-binary. <laughs> or, oh, well, no, 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 no. I mean, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't think so. <laughs> Oh, this is how how much how much does it cost to go to the University of Minnesota now? And opportunities for me to recognize who I really was and how I was going to walk in the world. However, as I encountered more people who identified as trans, whatever the suffix of that label might have been. I recognized, okay, this is another place where I don't quite fit in. I'm a little different in some way. The very first support group that I went to, I introduced myself, was overwhelmed because there was more than myself in the room. And at that point, I thought I was the only trans man in, in the world. I I'm sorry, Sarah, this is not true. This is, this is not true at all in any way i i no no i i've been with men with all of all sizes too and it does matter and i'm very sorry for men who haven't grown to the to the extent that they want to but it does matter and i don't believe we should lie to people it does matter and so where did you all come from and why haven't you been in my life sooner and all these things were going through my head and one guy 
stood up and said, I want to welcome you. I'm really happy you're here. And I want to tell you that I totally get what you were talking about when you were talking about race, because I adopted a black kid. So I totally know what's happening for you right mm. now. And while I was tempted to smash him into the wall, I did not. In he was talking about being three years old with his best friend in the bathroom. So they were both they were both boys. Like they were talking about having their pants pulled down to go to the, their, I mean, we can go back and rewind if you guys want, but if, if one, if one three-year-old is comforting another three-year-old saying it will grow, they're in the bathroom. They're both boys. Guys, remember queer and trans is not the same thing. Do we need, do we need a, 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 a reminder that queer and trans is not the same no, he didn't. He didn't say that. No, he didn't. He said he didn't look the same. Okay, let's go back and listen to the entire story again. I'll go back and listen to the whole fucking thing again. With my best friend at that time, who with whom I did everything. We played all with three years old. What do you do? You play. So that's what we did. We played a lot. And one time we both had to go to the bathroom at the same time. So we did because we did everything together. We went to the bathroom, pulled our pants down. He started peeing and I was just thinking, I'm gonna do that. And I thought, but I don't do it like that. Oh, and then when it was my okay, turn to pee, okay, you guys I are looked right. at him you again, because right. for some reason he hadn't pulled right. his pants up. He was okay. a little braggart even then. You guys are right. And I was certain that there was something wrong you with me. You guys are right. Mm. Like physically, when medically wrong. wrong with me that I needed to go to the hospital right then. So I proceeded to have a huge panic attack. And oh, okay, my bad, my bad. It's not, it's not a small dick because he was born a man and it didn't grow. It's a small dick because he was born a woman and didn't have a dick in the first place. Hey, Bobby, Bobby, we have to go to the hospital. Something's wrong with me. We got to go. We got to go. And he said, "What? What? I, not what? Are you why?" And I said, "Cause I look different from you." And this is why he was my best friend. He said, sometimes I take a shower with my dad and I, I looked at him and I don't look like him. So I said, daddy, how come I look different? And he said, because you have to grow and you have to, when you grow, you're going to look more like me. So then he turned to me and I don't know, I don't know how he knew to do this. He put his hands on my shoulders and said, it will grow. Now you have a three-year-old who's your best friend who says it's going to grow and has the evidence of his dad saying yours is going to grow because mine grew and so yours will grow when it's time when you get older. I just said, okay, cool. <laughs> Panic attack went away and we went out and had a great time. Now remember, we're three years old, so it didn't sound anywhere near as clear as that. It was, I thought it was a, it was a daddy, but this is about to say, how could you grow? Uh, and that was enough for me. And I spent a good 30 years after that. It's going to grow. It's going to grow. I'm not worried. It's going to grow. Didn't quite grow to where I wanted it to grow, but it did. And it was enough for me to realize that incident. Trans doesn't always mean that, though, especially when we're talking about non-binary queer activists. It doesn't always mean that they transition gender and several others were clarifying moments for me and opportunities for me to recognize who I really was and how I was going to walk in the world. However, as I encountered more people who identified as trans, whatever the suffix of that label might have been, I recognized, okay, this is another place where I don't quite fit in. I'm a little different in some way. And I'm saying that we need to read between the lines of what they're saying and they don't just because they say they're trans doesn't mean they're trans and we shouldn't be pretending that it does mean they're trans, especially when we've been around for a while and we know the difference. It's very guys, we are the only ones that that can hold ourselves accountable to what the language actually means. 
So if we're just taking what they're saying verbatim and we're not pulling it apart and saying, do they really mean that or do they mean this over here? We're not doing our job and we're failing. The very first support group that I went to, I introduced myself, was overwhelmed because there was more than myself in the room. And at that point, I thought I was the only trans man in, in the world. And so where did you all come from and why haven't you been in my life sooner? And all these things were going through my head. And one guy stood up and said, I wanna welcome you, I'm really happy you're here. And I wanna tell you that I totally get what you were talking about when you were talking about race because I adopted a black kid. So I totally know what's happening for you right mm. now. And while I was tempted to smash him into the wall, I did not. Instead, I burst into tears. And while I was crying, unashamedly, I wasn't trying to hide anything. If they didn't know the terms themselves, then they wouldn't be defining them for us in the course of their speech. They know the terms. The people who do not know the terms are conservatives who do not listen. Thing. It's like you created this drama, trauma, and mess. Now you get to live in it with me. So I wasn't allowing my tears to be wiped away. The snot was rolling down. And it was like, mm. no, you're all going to see this because you created this. So while I was doing all of that, another guy stood up and said, we're not doing this today. Now, I also should have said I was the only Black one in the room. So it was clear when anybody was talking about anything Black, they were talking about me. The second guy stood up and said, we're not doing this today. This man has come here, it's his first time. We're supposed to be supporting him and not telling him you have to split yourself in different categories in order to be in this room to get the support. And I said, why didn't you speak up first? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this would have been a much better experience if you were the first one to speak to me. But again, it became evident I'm not quite like whomever I'm supposed to be or whatever the label is supposed to be for me. I'm not quite fitting in. And that's been my experience the entire time. I would not necessarily identify myself as non-binary in the classical sense of the word, but I would say I've never really fit in anywhere. I've never been a woman enough for any woman, any female, any, any person who carries that label but I've also never been man enough for anyone who carries that label. And for many, many years, I did not want to be identified as a man. You could say that I was male, but I did not want to be identified as a man because a man came with the power struggle and the homophobia and the rudeness and the power differential and all that that I didn't want to be a part of. So it was easier for me to say, okay, you can say that I'm a male, but don't call me a man until even that didn't work anymore. So all of my journeys, all of my stops where labels have been placed on me or I have placed them on myself, there's always been this sense, but not really. You are, but you aren't. So much so that I wrote a little poem about it hmm. because I am a writer, in addition to a bunch of other things that you heard about in the bio. I was impressed by W.E.B. Du Bois and his poem that he wrote called uh, The Two-ness. And he wrote it in 1903, and he wrote a book called The Souls of Black Folk, and then he separated out a poem that was, uh, that was amazing, that was a way to express the duality that he lived with and that others who looked like him lived with. He wrote, one ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. So I wrote this poem 
to acknowledge my two-ness. It's a long poem. I don't think I'm going to read the whole thing, but I, the first stanza is what I really wanted to point out to you. And this is it. I am the he that she longed to be. Toiling daily with the desire to embrace all of me while not making invisible any of me. Striving to make you see all of me and cursing myself for feeling the need to buy into your need to see me as I wish to be seen. There's more where I'm talking about being the first in my family to be born in this country, um, to have had a child and yet to identify as a man and to want to be seen as a man without being forced to deny my history, which is, or at least then was considered uniquely feminine or female. I talk about speaking a language different from my family and not being taught that language on purpose so that I would be the real American. And all of my culture that was taken away because you need to learn English. We want you to be the American. We want you to be the one that people will turn to when they have questions, et cetera. So I was denied a big part of my culture because of that. I talk about someone who romances my friends, who has, who can fall deeply in love with my friends, but not so much with partners because of the dichotomy that existed between friends and lovers that I never understood. Everybody that I could love, I would love deeply and passionately. And it had nothing to do with sex. It had everything to do with my heart and my soul and my willingness to be connected to someone else. And how so often that willingness was recognized only when I was in partnerships. But if I said that my friend made me feel the best I'd ever felt in my life, my friend made me feel alive, my friend loves me deeply. Oh yeah, yeah, sure, okay. But, but your partner is the one who really does all of that. Well, I didn't have a partner. But even when I did have a partner, my friendships were still very strong and very important and very passionate to me. Even now, I, I find myself in this place where I romance my friends. I, and by that, I mean the things that we say we do for our lovers, our partners, our spouses, et cetera, I do for my friends. I make vows to my friends that I will be their friend, come hell or high water, in sickness and in health, et cetera. And I do that because my friends were the ones who always saved me. My friends were the ones who were always there for me and who showed me what love was. So I had love relationships long before I had love that included sex relationships. And that's hard to get some people to understand because we've been so clearly brainwashed into having that dichotomy. What is he talking about? I'm going to ask a really vague, open-ended question, but I have a really specific answer in mind for it. What is he talking about, do you think, when he talks about he has the same love for his friends as he does for his partners and even maybe stronger? He's talking about the collective. He's talking about erasing the family. Family of choice! Jane in with the win. That is, I that that went so much quicker than I thought it was going to. Jane, well done. That was exactly what was in my head. He's talking about having a family of choice. This is what a family of choice is. A chosen family. How his family didn't help him and his friends and the collective are what saved him. Communal love. The origins of polyamory, Co the comrades, he's talking about the comrades, he's talking about the collective, the family of choice, the family of choice meaning collective social interactions, 
a family for the state. The collective. I'm just, I'm, I'm like, I'm really, really thrilled that you guys all picked up on that because that was like, and this is what happens when you learn how to speak socialist is like most people would have heard that and just be like, oh, this guy just like really likes his, like really likes his friends. And they're not thinking about the underlying issues of what this is really about, which is uh, destroying the nuclear family, abolishing the nuclear family, because that's the underpinning of capitalism in the minds of these people. And the way they're going to abolish the nuclear family is to replace the nuclear family with a family of choice. That's how they're going to queer the nuclear family. There are only so many things that you can do with friends, and there are only so many things that you can do with lovers and partners, etc. And you must separate the two, because otherwise people are confused. Well, I'm in the relationship. I'm not confused. Mm -hmm. The person who's with me is not confused. It's only you who can't see it or who have your your uh, parameters around something that has nothing to do with you. You're the ones who are confused by it. So I'm not concerned about you. I'm concerned about that person I'm with or those people I'm with. I talk about, in the poem, I also talk about um, being an incest and rape survivor while also being highly sexual. And how can you do that? I used to go to, I don't know if they even have them anymore, but I used to go to these meetings called Incest Survivors Anonymous. I don't know how anonymous you can be. You walk into the room, everybody sees you and you're what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So nonetheless, I used to go to these meetings. And when I first discovered my interest in BDSM and kink, I refused to allow myself to be involved in it because, oh my God, I'm a survivor. I'm not supposed to. Does anyone have any theories about <clears throat> why specifically queer non-binary people are attracted to BDSM? Because it's kind of weird, right? It's like, and I and, 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 and I don't want to do just a throwaway. I don't want to hear from people they're queering sex. Okay, fine. Um, but like, there are a lot of sexual fetishes. Actually, I do have an idea. There are a lot of sexual fetishes. So why is it that specifically they bring up BDSM like all the time? They could be attracted to any number of sexual fetishes. But like, this is a really big thing within, within this community. We hear about it all the time. BDSM is about power. BDSM is out. I would. I don't know that I would argue BDSM is outside. And well, I mean, listen, man. When you have Fifty Shades of Grey being one of the best-selling books like of all time, I don't think we can argue that BDSM is outside of normativity. Although that was like BDSM light, but I don't think we can argue that it's outside of normativity. There were there were a lot of housewives that were engaging in in that sort of thing for many, 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 many years. Uh, I don't know that it's about power because the, I mean, it's about power for some of them. It's about, it's about submissiveness for others. I think, <clears throat> excuse me. I think BDSM reflects either a desire to go against normalcy. Again, guys, we cannot, we cannot pretend we need to keep ourselves honest. BDSM is not outside of normalcy when Fifty Shades of Grey was a massive, 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 massive success. So I don't accept that answer. I don't think that's correct. I don't think they have something neurologically wrong with them to be attracted to BDSM. I don't think that's it. Again, it's not queer. It's not queer when Fifty Shades of Grey is a fucking international bestseller. It fills some void. What void? I mean, it is, but like, again, it's like, it's like, why is it that specific fetish? I mean, there could be something to be said for the fact that these people are control freaks. They try to control everyone around them. And so, like, there might be an attraction to BDSM because at least for half of them, they get taken out of control.
They can break past an emotional barrier to experience a loss of control. But then you have the other half that are playing the dominant role. I don't believe that that being attracted to BDSM is a sign of childhood trauma. I don't think that that's true. I don't think we have evidence to support that. You guys are honestly going to tell me if you've ever spanked someone's ass during sex or had your ass spanked that it's a result of childhood trauma. Like, I don't, I don't agree. Do, do, do any of you guys like, no, this is, this is, this is, I, I understand conservatives are sexually repressed, but like. That's not okay. We're we're gonna have one of those days where people are being stupid. Okay, I'm I'm getting the message, guys. Truly, just because you don't understand it doesn't mean oh my fucking god, this is gonna be one of those days where I just want to smash my head against the wall because there it just seems to be no point. Just because you don't like something doesn't make it a major national bestseller spending 87,000 weeks at the top of the New York Times bestseller list having movies that were monumentally successful made about it just because you don't like something doesn't mean that other people don't like it All right, so we don't know. We don't have a good answer for why they're attracted to BDSM yet. I like sex, and I'm not like not supposed to like power exchange, and I can't do this because it would be wrong, and I'd be betraying all those people I was in those rooms with, and on and on and on, until I was clear, all I'm doing is once again depriving myself and once again trying to fit into a box that I do not fit into. But it took a long time, and there's still moments there's still moments when I'm playing with someone where I think this is wrong, this is bad. But why aren't this they furries? Not supposed to. Why happen. aren't they just furries? And that feeling or thought will go away, and be like, "This is the greatest thing I've ever done in my life, and I want to do it some more." And it's just. Did I turn it off? I turned it off. I didn't turn it off. Oh, okay. All right. So. I, I'm I'm sorry, Tayton. Like I I adore you. I appreciate you. The idea that people are attracted to BDSM because they have some sort of mental illness is retarded, bro. That's retarded. There is no... Uh, you're, again, I understand that conservatives are sexually repressed. I really do. I understand that they do nothing but the missionary position under the blanket with the lights off and all that. I get it. But not everything that you guys don't do is a result of mental illness, okay? So can we please be ethically honest? And Tayton, again, I know I, I I appreciate you. You do so much good work. You're finding all these great clips. But can we please be ethically honest about this? I'm actually looking for a real answer here. I'm not trying to own the libs. Okay, we still don't have a good answer for it. I'm going to ask everyone to actually think about this. And I need you, if you have never engaged in that sort of thing, I need you to put to put aside all of your preconceived notions. If you think that sort of thing is icky, I need you to put aside all of your preconceived notions because I actually would like an answer on like a deeply serious level about why queer people are so fucking attracted to BDSM. And I have not seen one answer in the chat that I think is is a correct answer so far. And I and quite frankly, I think a lot of the answers I'm seeing in the chat are lazy. I I, I really do, Tate. I don't mean to offend. I really don't. I appreciate you. I didn't say anything about kink, God, the day after Easter. I said nothing about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> and I'll do it again. So anyway, more, you don't fit, you don't fit, you don't fit, you don't fit. So my whole life has basically been not fitting and coming to the under- Brooklyn, then why aren't they just all furries? Again, there are any number of fetishes that, that involve cosplay.
Why aren't they just all furries? I don't know the answer, but I sure as shit know the answer is not something that I've seen yet. So why don't you stop being lazy and start figuring it out? Why do I have to do all the work here? Understanding it's all right that if if there is a universal way of being or thinking or experiencing, if there is something higher than ourselves, if there is a God, if there is something there or someone there, and they basically control the world, then they created me this way. And so it's okay. I can keep stopping it if you guys are going to keep saying dumb things. Then why is it this specific kink? Again, it like, this is such a throw. Guys, come on. Yes, please fucking do better. Please take Naptown's advice and do better. Like, come on. If we're going to put ourselves up as being years ahead of everyone else on the internet because of these issues, all of you need to fucking do better. Saying that queer people specifically talk about BDSM all of the fucking time and then saying the reason for that is they just want some kink in their life. Like, that's not a fucking reason. Why is it this specific kink? This is what I'm asking. Why is it this specific kink? There are a million different kinks in the world, and yet this is the one that they talk about all the effing time. Why is it this one? As we've already discussed, BDSM is not fringe when Fifty Shades of Grey is a massive, massive, ma I can keep saying the same thing over and over again, guys, if you keep making me say it. I swear to God. Not everyone in BDSM is dominated, it, it are submissive. Some of them are doms. So that doesn't explain it either. Queer theory and sex positive feminism are the or are the theories that have endorsed BDSM as a potentially healthy expression of erotic desire and love. But why? Why is it that specifically? These theories have aimed to critique the prevailing na uh, negative view of BDSM and to pathologize the phenomenon. But like again, like why? I mean, like they could have they could have fetishes where they they dress up as babies and wear diapers. They could be furries. They could be having sex outdoors in in plain view of anyone. They could be I don't know, like what other fetishes are there that aren't BDSM? Why is it specifically that? You didn't answer it, Brooklyn, because you you gave an answer that that does not rationalize when it's thought about with other things. I'm sorry. Not when Fifty Shades of Grey is a major bestseller. Like, again, BDSM is not outside of normativity. Guys, are you are you fucking serious? Like I I like it is it is mind-boggling to me that we're even having this conversation right now. It really is. Have you guys seriously never slapped someone on the ass during sex or been slapped yourself? Have you guys seriously never been tied up to a bed or tied so like have you guys seriously never done this? Like, this is like, I mean, I don't know, maybe my sex life is just better than, like, everyone else's sex life, but, like, this is like, like, it's like, come on! Are you shitting me? Like, normal people do this. <laughs> I cannot even believe we're having this conversation right now. I seriously can't. No, no one has said capitalism yet. We're figuring this out.
then why aren't they fucking furries? There are, Brooklyn, there are a million different fucking cosplays that they can do as well. Maybe it allows you to be open and not judged. I mean, again, a lot of things allow you to be open and not judged. So I don't think that that's it. I'm going to fucking put this in. Like, we're going to figure this out. I actually want to know the answer to this. I'm putting this in Twitter AI now. Hang on. I'm asking Twitter AI right now. Why in the ever-loving F are these people so pent up about BDSM? It's just going to take a second to load because that's the way it goes when I'm streaming. Why, dear Grok, why are queer people so attracted to BDSM question mark? That doesn't explain why queer, excuse me, why queer people are attracted. Oh, so non-queer people don't care about communication and trust? Let me see. It seems as though you're curious about the connection between BDSM and the queer community. You know, some some say that queer people invented the internet, but others claim they invented BD queer people did not invent BDSM. Come on. In reality, the queer community has a long history with BDSM, and it's not just a phase they're going through. There are a few reasons why BDSM is popular among queer folks. First, BDSM is all about breaking the rules, and queer people have been breaking societal norms since the dawn of time. How is BDSM about breaking the rules? That doesn't even make sense. Like, there are specific, you have to have, like, I, get, I, I can't believe I'm not, like, like, there are rules. Like, there are rules, there are, like, our boundaries, there are safe words, like, that doesn't even make sense. Plus, BDSM allows people to explore power dynamics in a safe and consensual way, which can be especially appealing to those who have experienced oppression, but that doesn't. Okay. And let's not forget that BDSM is often seen as taboo, except for Fifty Shades of Grey. And queer people have a long history of embracing the taboo. It's like they're saying, you think we're weird for being queer? Well, buckle up because we're about to get even weirder. Of course, not all queer people are into BDSM, just like not all straight people are into vanilla sex. But for many in the community, BDSM is an important part of their identity and expression. So the next time you see a queer person with a whip or ball gag, don't be alarmed. They're just expressing themselves in a way that feels authentic. I don't buy it. I do not buy it. Brooklyn, I don't give a flying fuck. I'm sorry. It doesn't compute with reality. It does not compute with reality. Well, no, Beth, my expectation is that people listen and they take in information. And if people are not listening, I am fine with explaining something the first time. I, I start to become less fine with it when I have to explain it 10 or 12 times within the same 15 minutes. It is my expectation that if you guys are coming to this, which is like a class, this is a class that you're going to listen to what's being said, you're going to process what's being said, you're not going to fucking argue with me, you're not going to ignore what's being said, you're not going to make me repeat myself 10 or 12 times. That is my expectation. Because there were three of them based on the three books that made hundreds of millions of... Are you guys seriously fucking arguing that Fifty Shades of Grey is not successful? That is the level of stupidity that we are that we have achieved today. You guys are actually arguing that Fifty Shades of Grey is both a, a series of really awful books and a series of really awful movies was not successful? That's next level stupidity, Jason. I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry. That's just ridiculous. We are not hinging into reality today. Uh, today, I see. You cannot argue that BDSM is not normal when Fifty Shades of Grey was mad. Like, like again, guys, if you guys make me say this one more fucking time, I'm going to just stop the stream. I swear to God. I'm seriously just going to quit the stream. This is one of the most moronic things that has ever happened in this chat. Just when I think I have the smartest audience on the internet, we achieve 50 Shades of Grey is not successful. Are you fucking kidding? I'm just scrolling through the uh, chat to see if I actually have any answers worth reading. I'm betting I don't, but hey. I'm I'm not being unfair at all, Beth. If you guys don't want to listen, then fucking leave. This is the bullshit that got me to almost fucking quit when I have to repeat myself over and over and over and over and over again on the same fucking stream because people are not fucking listening. Allison, thank you for the super chat. In my opinion, they want it all out in the open to F with people. Activism, it's always existed in private. But again, it doesn't explain why BDSM specifically is something that these people talk about all the time. I want to know why it's that specific fetish. What is it? Well, that would make sense if half the people engaging in BDSM weren't engaging in a dominant role. If they were all just being subs, that would make sense. That's not how BDSM works, though. All right. We still have no good answers that I'm satisfied with in the chat for why it's this specific kink. Um, if people come up with something that is not something that has already been said 15 or 17 or 27 times, please let me know. Beth, you've announced four or five times now that you're taking your toys and going home. So either come in and listen to the fucking presentation or get the fuck out. But don't stand in the doorway saying, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. Don't you see me leaving? Don't you see me leaving, Carlin? I'm leaving. You're being unfair, Carlin. I'm really leaving this time. I told you I was leaving already, but now I'm really leaving. Don't fucking do that shit. Either stay or go, and I don't really care which it is. If you aren't here to learn and you aren't here to listen, get the fuck out for me to be this way it's okay for me to not fit in the boxes mm. because i was made to not fit in the boxes it took me so long to get to that place but once i got there life was a lot easier we can keep arguing about this if you guys want but it is fucking retarded to claim that box office popularity and book sales is not reflective of the general attitudes of the public. You're honestly telling me that something that has made hundreds of millions of dollars is not considered to be normal? Something that was on the New York Times bestseller list for literally years is not considered to be normal? That's 
retarded. If the public is spending money on the thing in rates that are that large, that means it has achieved normativity. Thank you, Trendelin. How helpful. An article. Let's see. Hang on. It actually mentions Fifty Shades of Grey in this article. Let's look at this article that Trendelin just sent me. Be productive about this. Okay. It's time to recenter kink and BDSM as part of radical queer history. Fucking Google it yourself, Jason. Don't don't fucking ask me to Google shit for you that you can damn well do your fucking self. Rottweiler, thank you for the super chat. Maybe it varies from person to person. It could be the aesthetics for some, the sensory aspect to others. People can be attracted to the same thing for different reasons. Perhaps it's not a monolith. Well, Rottweiler, come on. There is always a reason that these people do everything. You're going to tell me that this is the one time when they all just have the same idea, but they're all doing it for different reasons when these are collectivists? That does not make sense. All right, we have achieved, like, I mean, I'm sorry, guys. I really am. I really thought we were going to get the year started on a better note than this. But, like, you guys have gone fucking retarded. You truly have. We have achieved retard level of the chat. Like, we fucking peaked when I have just spent half an hour arguing with you about whether or not Fifty Shades of Grey was a successful endeavor. I agree, Naptown. I agree. This is shameful. I am like I am fucking embarrassed about the level of critical thinking that is happening in my chat right now. Being old, they were raised by parents from the sexual revolution, so it's normal. No, fucking no. Are you are you guys kidding me? God damn it. This is fucking crazy. Truly and sincerely, this is crazy. That doesn't, that's not what fuck, okay. Can someone please give me a definition of normativity in the chat? How is it possible that I took two weeks off and you guys went fucking retarded? What is the definition of normativity? Is the definition of normativity something that you personally like? Is the definition of normativity something that is of high quality? Is the definition of normativity something that is a societal fucking norm? Is within the standard deviation? What is the definition of normativity? High fructose corn syrup is normativity because it's in every fucking food in the fucking supermarket. It doesn't matter whether or not it's good. Normativity, widely accepted. Normativity, the standard. I'm just, I'm totally blown away by this entire discussion. I really am. When we celebrate queer history, we're usually thinking about the elders who came before us and the sacrifices that they made to ensure the future generations wouldn't have to go through the same hardships that they did. But remembering that radical call or yeah, radical calls for acceptance and civil rights, we're really thinking about action-oriented activism. In doing so, we leave out the importance of the practice of kink and BDSM, which are radical acts in their own right. It's time to correct this to set, to include and center kink as a valid part of queer history 
because without it, we are erasing an essential part of our heritage. Okay, now we're getting to something. Why do they believe that queer, that, that kink and BDSM is an essential part of their heritage? If I have to say, and I'm, I'm deadly serious about this, guys, if I seriously have to point out one more fucking time how successful Fifty Shades of Grey was, I'm ending the stream. I am fucking turning the fucking car around and going home and you can all go watch something else and hopefully come back smarter tomorrow. Kink has been somewhat mainstreamed in recent years by films, books, and popular media like Fifty Shades of Fucking Grey. that speak to only one part of what it means to be in the lifestyle. But what exactly makes kink radical? There's a taboo around discussing sex and sexuality in our culture still, and it is especially seen as taboo for queer people who have been ostracized and outcasts for not falling into heteronormative expectations of how we should form love and form relationships. We are, well, this doesn't explain it either because it, okay, and I, and I do appreciate this queer sex is considered a kink in and of itself. Okay, fine. But BDSM is also a kink in and of itself. So why is it that specific kink? Jason, I'm sorry. I'm timing you out. Like, this is just, like, this is peak stupid with the arguing about whether or not Fifty Shades of Grey was successful. Fifty Shades of Grey grossed $166.2 million in the U.S. That's just one of the movies, I'm betting. Many kink and BDSM, an, uh, an acronym standing for bondage, discipline, sadism, and masochism, subcultures were formed in response to individuals' desires to fight against these expectations. There were often some of the few spaces where queer people before... This is it right here. Okay, now I'm understanding this. These were often some of the few spaces where queer people before civil rights efforts had gained any ground could form relationships that existed outside of shame and build their own communities. So essentially, queer P the BDSM is a part of queer heritage because they met each other in dungeons and fucked. And that was the place where they can meet other queer people was in the dungeon. Brooklyn, I'm going to time you out if this doesn't stop. I swear to God. It doesn't, it doesn't make it any more true the more you say it. And I love you. I adore you. I really do. But this is not what it is. And I don't care what the dominatrix in Seattle said. I don't fucking care. Just because the art... Brooklyn, the article is not saying the same fucking thing as you are. You are making a completely different argument than is being made in the article. Because you're not listening, because you're just talking and saying the same thing over and over and over again. I mean, my no, Brooklyn, you're not the one who's getting it today. You are saying a... Com Again, we have reached, what the fuck is going on today? Is there something in the water? How are you guys this retarded? Makes sense, and I believe that's how the speaker has explained his life, right? We're not even done the article yet, Tate, and I appreciate the super chat, but we're not even done the fucking article yet. This really shouldn't have been this difficult. 
Offering this kind of safe space for exploration is one of kink's greatest virtues as it provides another option for relationship building and sexual expression that doesn't subscribe to traditional notions of how these structures should exist. Kink includes rather than excludes. Oh, that's interesting. Kink includes rather than excludes because it is built on a foundation of embracing what can otherwise be that's what it is. They feel that BDSM is going to be more inclusive of people who might otherwise have trouble finding sexual partners. Aha. Well, it's a good thing you stuck around then and didn't take your toys and go home like you threatened to a couple times in the chat if it didn't go the way you wanted it to. So this specific kink, for some reason, is considered inclusive. Pro and I'm betting it's because, I mean, it's probably one of the more accessible kinks to participate in, in terms of, like, anyone can go to a dungeon Brooklyn, you, okay, Brooklyn, I'm sorry. Time out. You did not say the same thing. Perhaps possibly listen while you're on time out because you are not, you did not say what is being said in this article. A communal sexual, well, that makes sense. Yeah, it's a communal sexual interaction in the dungeon. Not that I would know anything about that, obviously. Obviously. In this formation in rejection, kink and the LGBTQ community members have much in common. One of those commonalities is the freedom to develop new and unique ways of relating. Within kinky subcultures, participants have to create their own traditions, practices, and even language to connect and express who they are and how they feel. The practice of... <laughs> I cannot, cannot even believe we're having this conversation. Flagging is a prime example of this. Flagging is the practice of using handkerchiefs within the queer and kink community communities to indicate interests and fetishes with different colors indicating different identities, top, bottom, switch, and acts like bondage and S&M. For those outside of the community, these colors would simply be interpreted as fashion, but flagging, con uh, co flagging covertness allows this form of identification with queer individuals in the lifestyle being able to find each other without doubly outing themselves to exist even in non-kink spaces. This kind of passing is vital for the uh, queer kink community to continue to exist, even where any outward display would be frowned upon. Yeah, I, I, I first read it as flogging too. I did. Mm -hmm. Flagging is a radical act because it centers queer resistance, even in spaces where being openly out isn't an option. I mean, that would be another thing with BDSM, right? Because, like, BDSM is not necessarily about, like, fucking. In fact, like, oftentimes, and again, there's no reason I should know this in particular, you don't even, like, have sex. Thank you, Carlin, and sorry. I appreciate that, Dragon Water. So it's like if you're queer, well, queer, it can be a way to have some sort of like sexual interaction without without actually like outing yourself as like being gay or whatever.
do, 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 do. A, central a, a central theme that runs through queer history is the stigma asserting that queer sexuality is wrong, dirty, and something to demonize. Yet flagging is a practice that has historically helped so many in the community to turn such stigmas on their head. Queer sexuality is an important part of our identities, and by acknowledging how important kink has been for queer history we can begin to see the ways the, that flagging and kink can connect us within the community to the power we have and remind us of how far we've come. Enga this article isn't even really addressing the question, but it's given us some information at least. Engaging in kink as a queer person today is part of that practice. Okay, so what's very clear to me is they consider BDSM to be like the only kink, which isn't true. But they're writing about it as though it's the only kink that people can have. <clears throat> it is a celebration of our sexuality, but it also connects us to a community that is larger than us. Queer and kinky communities can continue to thrive and live on, even as they adapt to, to better fit the social temperature of the time in order to preserve the community's history. And in doing so, uh, we allow for this part of our history to carry forward as it should be. Okay. That article was helpful, Trendelin. I appreciate it. Let's go back to the presentation. I'm not discussing this anymore. Once I understood, oh, it's supposed to be like this. I'm supposed to not fit in. And my job is to help people to know it's okay to not fit in. So when I go and do these talks about whatever it might be, I'm always very clear to say, you don't have to fit into whatever labels have been given to you. You can choose other labels if you want to. And yes, there will be people who will try to prevent that from happening and who will try to tell you you're wrong and, and evil and put all those other labels on you, but you don't have to accept them. You have the choice to say, yeah, I'm kind of not going for that. And you will find others who feel the same. It might take a while, but you'll find them. We're all out there. It's just finding us, starting our own group, our secret handshake and all that. We're going to make that happen. But in the meantime, we get to live in the world that doesn't accept us and say, I'm still here anyway. I'm going to remain here. So you can keep feeling uncomfortable or you can move on. Because I've already moved on from your discomfort and the trauma you're trying to instill in me, not having it anymore. So I'll stop for now. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad that you talked about um, the duality. Um, I think that, you know, for many folks that living as we are told or redirected, you know, we, we kind of know as kids and then we get redirected. You know, I didn't, I didn't really know anything about gender when I was climbing trees with all the boys on the block. Girls aren't supposed what to climb I did trees. Know is that there was something not okay with me doing that in dresses. And there was something okay with me not remembering that I was a girl. Um, to the point that, you know, at one point my mom kind of ordered me out of the tree, um, as parents do, using like all of your names. Um, and you know, she told me that it wasn't very ladylike for me to be climbing the tree. To which I replied, I am no lady, mm -hmm. right? Like very defiantly stomping my foot. And I think that that um, thing about kind of trying on, you know, we, we have these prescribed areas in which you can act. You have to do this thing in this area and this thing in this area. You have to act this way when you go to church or synagogue. You have to act this way when you're on the playground. And sometimes we don't have a full understanding of what that means. When I worked at District 202, the young people were like, are you sure you're a lesbian? And I was like, no, I'm definitely not. That word has never felt right for me, but I didn't She's obviously know what else a lesbian to really call the behavior that I was engaging in, right? There's like one word 
for women who have sex with women. And that's at least been a lesbian. Although it never really felt right to me. I, I never really felt like a lesbian. And it always, even now, maybe you can hear it. It feels weird, weird when I'm trying to say it. Um, and so trying those things on. And young people were like, um, you're trans. <laughs> Don't you know? You know? <laughs> and I was like, um, but I'm not because I'm not boy enough. Um, I'm, I'm not because I don't think I want to take hormones. I'm not because I don't think I want to have surgery. So therefore I, I can't be trans because I don't want to do these things that trans people do. And I'm not going to go sit in a room with some therapist who's going to tell me what I'm supposed to do. Like I'm not doing that. Right. And and they're not going to certify me as good enough to get hormones. Like I'm not doing that. Right. And I, I think it wasn't really until I got with Anna, my partner. Um, you know, like young people were kind of giving me these clues, right? You know, telling me things, Billy and other these other people were telling me things that I didn't really quite understand, but felt writer to me than the way that I'd been raised. Um, but Anna didn't make me do that. I didn't kind of have to choose between gender. I didn't have to be boy enough or girl enough or black enough or mom enough or, you know, like I didn't have to conform to anything. Um, and that felt really great. And when I would questioned like I remember at one point I really questioned um like how how my partner was seeing me um and I was really feeling like you know maybe you don't see the the female part of me because it's there and it exists and sometimes I don't know what to do with it um and so my partner wrote me a poem yeah. that talked about how she loved me as he and me as she and me as they and just me. Um, and I, I have that poem still um, because sometimes I forget. Sometimes I have self-doubt. Sometimes I don't know if I want to put on like a bustier or, you know, jogging pants. Right. Um, and so um, being able to sit in. They treat gender. Bed, hang on. I am me. I want to get that. I want to get a clip of that because what what they're talking about is is gender as like an outfit. And this is this is what they do all the time. Like when they're describing like gender, it's like, I don't know if I want to. Uh, I don't know if I want to put on a bustier or jog or jogging pants. Well, guess what? Women can wear fucking jogging pants. I'm wearing leggings right fucking now. I wear leggings or sweatpants almost every day of my life. That has nothing to do with being a man or a woman. It has to do with working at home and not needing to put on constricting clothes. But I just want to get that a clip of that real quick. Specifically because of like the changing the clothes stuff. it's there and it exists and sometimes I don't know what to do with it um and so my partner wrote me a poem yeah. that talked about how she loved me as he and me as she and me as they and just me um and I I have that poem still um because sometimes I forget. Sometimes I have self-doubt. Sometimes I don't know if I want to put on like a bustier or, you know, jogging pants, right? Um, and so um, being able to sit in that I am me and I get to project that however I'm feeling in the moment and it's okay. Um, 
I think was a really hard, hard place to get to. And, um, and I don't know that I could have gotten there without like community and partners saying, like, you actually just get to be who you are today, right now in this moment. All right, got my clip. Yeah. Wow, that's incredibly powerful. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and brave, no, stunning and you, brave. You both talked about poetry. Um, you shared some art. Like, how how does art play a role in um, gender politics and your own gender? expressions or does it art plays a role in everything that i do i mean i shit in a really artistic way wow <laughs> oh i'm sorry i'm supposed to put the disclaimer on that i swear i'm so sorry if i've offended you not really I mean, if that's the worst thing you're going to hear from me, you're lucky. <clears throat> See, we talked about the swearing thing yesterday, too. They purposefully swear in these types of presentations to be outside of normativity. And they do shocking things like say like say that, like, I shit in an artful way. Like, that's all to like, that's to to, to queer what they're supposed to do. Although I do, I I do believe there is value in uh, infusing art into everything that people do. I think that if people, I, and this is this is some place, this is this is where the political right really fails because the political right are not creative. They're not artists. They do they like the political right does horrible art. This is why the Daily Wire just like made a Snow White movie because they couldn't come up with their own original story. They had to like make a movie responding to the Snow White movie. It's like ridiculous. Peyton, the most telling thing to me about their commitment is denying trans and hormone therapy because that supports uh, normative. What do you mean? Denying trans and hormone therapy because it supports normativity? I'm not sure I understand what you mean by that, Tayton, but I do appreciate the super chat. Yeah, we need to make more subversive art. There need to be more autists. No pun intended. Allison and I can't do all the work. I... Art really is invaluable to my existence because there were too many times when I couldn't speak, literally could not speak or figuratively felt it was too dangerous for me to speak, so I won't do it. And I kept myself and I kept Oh, I, see. I kept who I, I see. really Thank was and who clarifying. I wanted to be from the world. And I was ahead. Thank you. I was very intelligent as a kid. I was constantly fighting with two or three other people in my class for the number one spot. I went to a Catholic school as a, whatever you call that, whatever it is when you're not a tween, the younger part of it. I went to a Catholic school then. And as much as I loved showing off my intelligence, I hated going to school because I didn't wanna compete. I wasn't, I wasn't a competitive person. I was just an intelligent person, but I was forced into this role of it's the three of you and you've always got to fight about who's number one. And if you miss by this much, then there's something wrong and you've got to work even harder. And, and I bought into that for about 22 seconds. And then I said, you know what? Why can't we all just be smart? Hmm. Why does it have to be someone has to be number one? Eventually we'll all oh. be number one because we keep moving back and forth depending on how many collectivists do not like competition within the collective things we mistake on the quiz or or say wrong on the test but but i don't hate these people and i don't wish them ill will and i don't want them to not succeed and yet that's what you're trying to put into me so yes uh, the catholic church loves me <laughs> um and i'm still a catholic no one is going to take that from me I was born and raised a Catholic. I am still a Catholic, but I am a Catholic that gets into a lot of trouble with the church because I point out the bullshit that exists within the church because I think, believe that is what is being Christ-like, not being a Christian, but being Christ-like. Mm -hmm. He will, the person that we call Christ was not uh, 
meek and mild and quiet and reserved and only spoke in parables and you know apparently never ate anything except his very last supper <laughs> never had any relationships other than with these 12 guys um you know he wasn't he wasn't that he wasn't what is given to us as god as jesus but he was christ like when he got really upset yeah he engaged in some violence and he made people he damned pay a big attention tree. and he said things that caused people to stop and think and wonder and question and that's what i want to do i don't want to be turning over tables the money changers tables and all that but i do want to cause people to be uncomfortable mm. because when you're uncomfortable you work so hard to get back to homeostasis to, to them you know you just made me think of uh he made me think of like during uh you guys remember when like white fragility was on like the New York times bestseller list forever, like back in 2020 and everyone had to do these whiteness trainings. And when they were doing these whiteness trainings in workplaces, they were always, they were always saying, you're going to feel uncomfortable. You have to feel uncomfortable. You are going to make you feel uncomfortable. You have to sit in your discomfort and stuff like that. And I guess like I knew this in theory, but it just like, I, I just explicitly thought about it where the whole point of like those whiteness trainings and diversity trainings, it wasn't, we know it's not about race. We know that's never what it was. It was about introducing this idea of discomfort because queer activism is all about upending the normal, upending normativity, doing something that is abnormal. If you do something that is abnormal, that is inherently going to make you feel uncomfortable. Like, like, you know, I mean, like the, the cliche, like going outside your comfort zone is like thrown around a lot. I used to throw it around a lot when I was doing like corporate coaching and stuff like that. You have to go outside your comfort zone. You're inherently going to feel uncomfortable when you're outside your comfort zone. But like the reason that is, is when you're doing something that is not the norm of what you're used to doing, that the learning of a new thing is inherently uncomfortable. Right. And so when you're talking about queer activism, it's all about upending normativity and they were using, and this is why conservatives have got to beat this out of themselves, that this is not about race at all. The diversity training, the equity training, all the stuff that conservatives say over and over and over again is just race, 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 race. It was never fucking about race. It was about upending normativity and forcing people to feel uncomfortable. And forcing them to feel uncomfortable as a part of the process, saying you're stunning and brave for feeling uncomfortable, because if they can get them to a place where they are accepting of the discomfort, then they are going to be better able to upend normativity. And normativity, as we all know, is effing capitalism. Does that make sense? Well, it's a struggle session, but what is the purpose of the struggle session? Guys, we're, we're going to go beyond now. We're not doing the normal shit. You've been around a while. What is the purpose of the struggle session? The purpose of the struggle session is to get someone to accept something that is outside of normativity. Yeah? Aha, Bill. You know what I love about Bill? Is that Bill doesn't jump right into the conversation. Bill sits back and he thinks about stuff and then he like swoops in and was like, with like the right answer. Getting off on making people uncomfortable. Isn't that BDSM? There it is. There it fucking, God, I knew, I knew Bill, Bill was going to have the answer to this. They like BDSM as a kink because BDSM is getting off on making people feel discomfort or getting off on feeling discomfort yourself. That's the 
That's the fucking answer. Bill in for the win. It took us a while to get there, but that is the fucking answer. Yes. Well done. I'm taking a screenshot of that. Hang on. See, now people get it. Now people get it. Aha. And this is why we don't just accept the first answer, guys. This is why we don't take the easy answer if the easy answer makes no logical sense when played out in reality. Balance. And while you're trying to get back to that balance, that's my open to try and change. Michael, if you're going to stick around on this channel, you need to accept the fact that whiteness means capitalism. If you want to know why, I'm going to have a chart going up on my Substack later today that explicitly explains why whiteness means capitalism. I know you come out of that world where you guys will not accept this, but, but if you don't get this, you don't understand what we're doing here. I'm sorry. Whiteness means capitalism your mind a little bit about how you think about things or how you think about people like me that you don't understand that you want to question but you're afraid to question but you're, you have to question because you've been taught if somebody or something is different I either run away from it or I try to kill it and I want you to get to that place of I'm uncomfortable I don't know what to do I want to change this I want to go back to status quo because that's easier but what if I did ask a question? Or what if I did allow that, that person to speak to me for an extended period of time and I got to know them a little bit? What would happen then? And my goal is that you'll stay in that spot long enough to say, oh, I'm not gonna die if I ask a question and I'm not gonna die if I hear the answer. So maybe I'll do this instead. Maybe I'll learn something today. That's my goal in everything that I do, that you get. Michael, I know you're relatively new, but we're going to stick to the topic at hand. This is a class to learn about this stuff. You are significantly behind a lot of people in my chat. So if you are not here to listen and you're going to be disruptive, I'm just going to remove you from the chat. Whiteness means capitalism because what these people believe is that capitalism, which means private property ownership, created slavery. Slavery created systemic racism. Systemic racism created racial disparities in the United States, which are inequities. And the only way to solve the racial inequities that they are always referring to when they say whiteness, white supremacy, anti-racism, whatever they're talking about in regards to like, like race or skin color or any of that, what you think is race and skin color is not actually about individual race and skin color. It's about the system of capitalism that created slavery in the first place. And the only way to fix racism as these people define racism is to abolish capitalism. That is the answer. That is the only answer that is based on watching thousands of hours of these people talk about it. And that's, 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 that is, that is what it is. If you want to fight that, you don't belong here. If you want to learn, you're more than welcome to stay. Get to that place of discomfort. And from that, you move to, uh, oh, I'm still uncomfortable, but not as much. And I don't see this person as a threat. That's what I try to do. And it's difficult at times because people don't understand. They don't figure it out. So one of the ways that I do that is through art, through writing, through singing. I, I was in the Transcendence Gospel Choir, which was the first all trans gospel choir, it, at least in this country. And we would go and sing in churches and in temples and in mosques. We would sing wherever anybody would let us sing. And we sang gospel music. There was no twerking going on at that point. <laughs> It was gospel music, and that's what we sang because go, that's Allison. the message we wanted to carry. That was our way of doing ministry as trans people. And that allowed me to not be separated from the church, but also to be fully, fully openly trans in a religious space and still be able to say, I belong here as much as anyone else. 
and you will be enriched in your life if you will just talk to me rather than be frustrated with me or try to kill me because you don't understand me. I have had so many opportunities to be an ambassador for change. And I really like that. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of heartache sometimes, but it's absolutely worth it. And art gives me the opportunity to get into those venues. And once people have an awareness of me and they're willing to listen to me, things can change. Mm -hmm. I know that the gift that I have been given is to be vulnerable, to be open, and to draw people in and from that to help them to learn a new way of being, a new way of experiencing. So that's what I do. And art gives me that, opens that door for me. So I, I could never walk away from art. I could never walk away from what it does for me, how it has saved me time and again, how it is the bomb when I have to deal with silliness, that I can come back to writing something or I can listen to music or I can read someone else's writings or I can watch a play or I can listen to a musical. I can do any number of things. I can look at Edward Hopper's I can never remember the name of the the painting, but it's the it's a in, diner. In the dining room. Yeah. In the diner. Yes. Yeah. And that I don't know why that one particular painting has stuck with me. I'd never even been in a diner at that point. And let me just point out Lone Wolf says, Bro, I bet they get off so hard making conservatives cringe hardcore and watch them react. They do. This is why I keep telling people, like, I've, I've been to their private meetings. I've been with them when there's no cameras on them, when the doors are closed, when they don't think that people are listening to them. They fucking love making conservatives cringe. Making conservatives react, rather. They love it. They love the book banning bullshit. They love the school board stuff. They love all of this stuff. They talk about it all the time. They, they do literally get off on it. They want to do more of it. But conservatives, because they only know how to react, don't listen. And I'm like, you know, you're doing exactly what, exa like literally exactly what, you know, you, they want you to do, right? You're, you're, they're, they're holding out, they're holding out bait in the form of purple slime that I'm playing with. Let me make it a little bit smaller. Ah, the slime won't break. There it goes. Here's what they're doing. Because they get off on this, they're holding out a form of bait saying, take the bait, conservatives. Take the bait, take the bait, take the bait. Please, please take the bait. We want you to take the bait so badly. And then conservatives are like, fuck you, give me that slime. And then they run around and they complain about the slime and they, they're showing off all the slime and they cr create entire organizations around the bait that they were just handed. And it's like, and then the conservatives are like, we're winning, we're winning, we're winning. We took the bait. We're winning, we're winning, we're winning. And all the time, the left are sitting back and laughing at them because they were like, ha, 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 we got them to take the bait in the first place. Ha, 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 we're winning. But they don't, they don't do that in public. They don't come out and do it in public as much because that wouldn't be fun, right? The magician doesn't give away their tricks. They just get off on the fact that they can do the trick on the stage in front of the audience. But the audience is so goddamn distracted by the magician's assistant who's twirling around in a little sparkly dress and has her boobs out and has her butt out. And the audience are like, oh, my God, look at the magician's assistant. She's so pretty and she's twirling and the magician's over here doing the trick the entire time. It's the same thing. I'm from Rhode Island, and Rhode Island used to have the most diners in the entire United States. Thank you very much. So I, I don't know why that, that particular picture hits me, but it does. And it, it's just a few people there. And I felt the loneliness, and yet I felt the community. And, and I, maybe that's why it, it speaks to me, because it, it's another way of saying we're all alone, and yet we're all together. And we have so many yes. more opportunities to, to gather. This is Jenny. This is exactly right. 
the left is playing a game of why are you hitting yourselves with conservatives and conservatives don't even know it. That's exactly right. But you know what, guys? They got the president of Harvard to resign, and so they're winning. Conservatives are winning. Don't you know? The president of Harvard resigning is going to change absolutely everything. You know, I actually have to give it to Chris Rufo. I was not expecting the president of Harvard to resign. I thought the very best thing they would get would be like she would make it through the end of the semester and leave after graduation to go pursue other opportunities. So I have to give him credit for getting her out. But it's like I, I asked this on Twitter earlier. I was like, what do you guys think you're winning by getting the president of Harvard to resign? What progress have you made? What tangible changes will be made? Will Harvard even change? Like, what's going to happen? Because I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen. They're going to replace her with someone who is worse. They're going to replace her with someone who is just as bad, if not worse, and nothing is going to change. But conservatives like, we're winning. This is the start. The DEI system is collapsing. They're taking Rufo's talking points because Rufo's putting this out on Twitter. He's like, the DEI system is collapsing. And, and all conservatives are like, yes, yes, the DEI system is collapsing. We're winning. We're winning. We're winning. Now, in the meantime, the ousted president of Harvard is still on the faculty at Harvard, is still going to be teaching students at Harvard, is still going to be making $900,000 a year, is going to be replaced by someone as bad, if not worse. And to kick it all off, there's still an equity department in every single K-12 through public school district in the country. There's you're, you're talking about the DEI complex collapsing because the president of Harvard resigned. There is still literally an equity office in every single K-12 through school district in this country. How the F? Can you say with a straight face that the DEI complex is collapsing when it's still being taught in your kid's school every day? And you don't even probably know the names of the people who are doing it. You probably don't even know the names of the office. You probably don't know any of this stuff. How is it possibly collapsing when they're still doing every single thing that they were already doing before? But you got the president of Harvard to resign, bro. High five yourself. Like, are you kidding me? And then I, so I asked them this on Twitter and they're like, well, she's held accountable. How the fuck was she held accountable when she still has a job and is making $900,000 a year and is now actually put in a position where she has more influence over students than she did before? It's like they don't think these things through at all. It's like, listen, man, again, I will give Rufo credit for this one. It was a great media stunt. He got a lot of publicity over it. He got a lot of people talking about him. It was it, it was it's good. I mean, it's not like I'm not I'm not saying it's like a loss to get her to resign, but it's like it wasn't a win either. What did you actually win other than a lot of media attention for Chris Rufo? I mean, truly. Well, we're going to hold every college president accountable. No, you're not. No, you're not. If And and by the way, if you got every... I worked in fucking higher ed for 10 years, man. Let me tell you what. Do you know what college presidents do? Do you know what the number one job of a college president is? Does anyone know? Guesses in the chat. I know we'll go back to this in a second, but like guesses in the chat. What is the job of a college president? Fundraising, dragon water for the win. Fundraising to raise money. To raise money. That's all they do. Truly. Again, that's all they do. They are not the ones running the college. They are spending all their time raising money. So if you got every single college president to resign today, it still wouldn't make a difference. Because those are not the people who are implementing the DEI shit. It's like, what did you, oh, you took out their chief fundraiser? Guess what? They're going to hire another chief fundraiser. That's probably going to be just as bad as the last chief fundraiser. 
it's like this is why and i know people and 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 when i point this out to conservatives they're like so you don't want us to do anything no can you please just do something that's a goddamn productive for once like I'm not saying don't do anything, but if you want to get people fired, can you maybe actually, I don't know, get the diversity people fired or get the deans fired or get the professors fired or go after the actual Marxist activists like the ones we're watching on the screen right now? These are actual Marxist activists. Can you go after any of the Marxist organizations? Can't, like, I mean, it's not like these people announce themselves all the time. It's not like it's a secret who they are. Can you go after the real people that are actually doing things, not the college presidents? You just don't want us fighting at all. No, I want you fighting like not like retards. I want you playing like you're playing fucking chess and not checkers. You're a leftist. Okay, I see. I see. I see. All right. You want to lose. I get it. Yep. It's as if the right cares about high-profile wins instead of actual wins. That's right. So frustrating. Anyway. Gather and to be even more together if we will just take the chance. Hang on. Tayton, super chat. Why didn't they do congressional? Yes. Why didn't they do congressional hearings with deans? Why don't they do congressional hearings with diversity directors? Why don't they do congressional hearings with these SEL companies? Why don't they do congressional hearings with real Marxists, with Ibram X. Kendi? Why don't they do like with real Marxists that we can identify as Marxists because they say they're Marxists on the goddamn internet? Why aren't they doing congressional hearings with people who actually matter in the grand scheme of the problems that they're claiming that they want to solve? Because the right cares more about appearance than they care about truth. Yeah, I know that came in very well. Wow. Um, art is vital um, to me and so many people. Um, art is so important to me that I started a production company called Rare Productions uh, with my friend Rochelle James. Um, Snap. Thanks. Uh, and have been able to work through Rare Productions uh, with my partner and with many other <laughs> The writer, um, performative artists, too. Exactly, yes. Both y'all. Um, and and so, uh, so art is vital. Um, art is also uh, responsible for uh, the power to the people stage. And so since we're coming into Pride season, this will be our 20 year anniversary for the power to the people stage. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, and the power to the people stage was really inspired um, and started through uh, a, a black trans woman who was discriminated against within the confines of pride. And she was kicked off stage. They cut her music um, and told her she could not perform. And she came over to where I was tabling and said, you better do something about this. Like she was done. It, it, it happened to her and her friends before. Um, and so we, started a whole area within the framework of Twin Cities Pride, specifically for um, Black, Indigenous, people of color artists who wanted to perform for other artists. Um, and, and art comes to me in all kinds of ways all day long, um, and it's powerful. Um, and so, yeah, I need art, I want art, um, and I think I would be in a really um, hurting place without it, especially over these last couple of years. So I, I want to ask one more question and then kind of open it up for questions from the audience. Is that okay? Or you guys want to jump in now? One more question. All right. So I'm, I'm just curious, you know, and uh, yo, you talked about kink and BDSM and, um, you know, which I think of as healthy sexuality. 
And so I'm hoping that either of you or both of you can kind of talk about the role that quote healthy sexuality, clear boundaries, clear um, desires. Um, and we all three have done desire mapping. Um, desire at, mapping? At creating change and really what? getting into what? With, you know, those desires. They did desire mapping at a conference. They they did a session where they met. Wait, seriously? But maybe talk about how that can be liberating. And I know for me, being able to explore that space really pulled me sort of out of this kind of binary that I had been living in um, as, you know, I came out as a trans woman, so I have to do all female women. Wait, is a trans social, woman? Societal pressure that Whoa. women conform to. Uh, and in that process, I was able to understand that I'm a fuller person than that. And so I'm just curious how that has impacted. I, 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 I did too, Yasmin. I did too. Yeah. I know that when I was willing to accept trans being woman, a kinky person, it had taken many, many years to get to that stage. So let's go back. Let's circle back, as Jen Saki says. We're going to circle back to when I was three, four, five, and before I was 10. Because I was in Catholic school, we said prayers five times a day. I don't know if that was to wear us down so that by the time we were done with the day, it was all about I can't do anything wrong because I have confessed all of my sins mm -hmm. at eight o'clock this morning. And I don't know if I have any more sins between now and then. And I must have done something wrong, though. And so I, I don't know if we were just getting settled for the nighttime prayers where it was, OK, here's what I did between school and now. I, I really don't know what all that all the praying was about, but I do remember that part of the prayers were praying for in this particular order, Jews, that they might find Jesus. That's anti-Semitic. And that it was my job to help them to find Jesus. That's but my way to do that was to pray for them. Whoa! So I had to pray for them. And then I also had to pray for people who, um, how was it described? Who engaged in violent activities. Now, when you're single digits, you don't know what the hell violent activities means because you go out and you push your friend and they push you and you're rolling around and wrestling and you're in the dirt and you, you know, that's violence, but, but it's not bad violence. But I was told violence is bad and hitting people is bad. So every third prayer of the day was about praying for the people who hit people and engaged in violence. And then the third topic that had to be discussed or had to be prayed for was people who had sex with children. Hmm. So see, they're not though, all and I, I mentioned the order because it's particular to me that as an incest survivor, there were two rows ahead of me, two groups of people ahead of me <laughs> that I had to be praying for and that others were going to be praying for before they were praying for the survivor. When I told my one Jewish friend what I had been told to do, he just laughed his ass off. You had to spend time, and you don't just pray. When you're in Catholic school, it's not about you're just praying. You are on your damn knees every single time that you're praying in the classroom, no little rug to support your knees, no nothing. You're just on that hard floor praying for the Jews that they might find Jesus. So when I told him about that, he looked at me and said, why? 
And question. I said, okay, you know how lucky you are because there's no convent around here. When I asked why, I had to go sit on a bench in the convent for the entire day. That was my punishment. I had to sit and watch the nuns float back and forth. Do, do Catholic schools still... Do Catholic schools... I fucking... Am, I, I, I want them to mention capitalism so bad. We still have like 20 minutes left. Maybe we'll get to it. Maybe we won't. But like, do do Catholic schools still make kids pray that the Jews will find Jesus? Is that like a real thing? Like, has anyone been to Catholic school where they made you pray for that the Jews were going to find Jesus? That's kind of that's kind of funny, honestly. Because <laughs> you know, nuns don't actually touch the floor; they just float right on by you and i had to watch that i had to listen to that i had to be a part of all of that and you just get to ask the question why and i get to answer and that's not fair he said that well that's what happens when you're jewish you, you don't have to do the things that you guys do and it helped me to recognize once again i don't fit in i'm not the way i'm supposed to be i'm not the way others are telling me i need to be and why are incest survivors and rape survivors the third down the line for praying to or praying for? That got me sent to the convent as well. But what I learned was hypocrisy lives. <laughs> hypocrisy lives very strongly. And I've gotten to a point where I recognized, okay, this is silliness. I'm not going to pray for for Jews salvation. They all look kind of happy and, and doing their, their life the way they want to. So I don't need to be somebody trying to make it better for them. People who beat people. Hmm. Okay, I like beating people. They seem to like me beating them. How do I reconcile this with every single day praying for those people who beat people. Whoa! And it took me a very long time. I would not get involved in... Okay, so, so... He's reconciling the fact that Catholic school taught him to pray for people who engaged in violence, but he likes beating people in a kinky relationship and so he had to reconcile being taught to pray for people who engage in violence with liking to whip people in dungeons and that sort of thing and they seem to and they seem to like me beating them let's just let's just relive that that uh that that beauty again let's just do that again trying to make it better for them. People who beat people. Hmm. Okay, I like beating people. They seem to like me beating them. How do I reconcile this with every single day praying for those people who beat people? And it took me a very long time. I would not get involved in kink for the longest because I could not reconcile that. Until one day, I was talking to someone. We were actually trying to negotiate a scene. And I said, I just don't know if I can actually do this because all my life I've been told this is the one of the worst things you could ever do. And I prayed for people who do stuff like this and it's just bad and wrong and I shouldn't. And the person stopped me and said, but you have my consent. Mm -hmm. And when I came to, I recognized, oh, and that's what the difference is. There's consent involved in this. There's not me overpowering you and doing evil, nasty, disgusting things to you without you agreeing to it. Oh. There's you agreeing to me doing nasty, disgusting, mm -hmm. evil things to you and wanting it and enjoying it and getting pleasure from it. So you know how, you know how, so, so. You got you guys know how so many of you answered earlier when I said why are these people so attracted to BDSM you were like they're attracted to the power dynamics but it but it's not really 
because they're consenting, they're negotiating everything. So it's like, it's like in BDSM. And again, there's no real reason I should know this, but one of the things I have ascertained is that like in BDSM, do you know who really has all the control? The submissive. The submissive has all the fucking control. The submissive can stop it at any time. The submissive sets the boundaries. The su- like it's like it's they 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 are they, they they are completely they submissives top from the bottom all the time. And so it's not really a power dynamic in the way I think that people think it is. Yeah. The sub calls the shots. A troll pest isn't a sadist, but a masochist trying to provoke a sadistic reaction. Yeah, I think there's truth to that, Bill. That is what made the difference. When someone actually said to me, you're locking yourself into a box that you don't have to be in. So I could begin to explore kink and I could begin to enjoy it. And I do. And I will continue to, but I will be completely honest with you. I still go through, I had to pray for people like me that we would be saved. And I have to put myself through that to let go of it, to say, and I guess I've been saved because I'm still here. I'm still doing the stuff that people said I'm not supposed to do. And no one has died and no one has sued me and no one has dragged my name through the community. And none of that has happened because I've actually been honest. Well, you literally can consent to doing that and people have consented to doing that, but you're also blowing it out of proportion because BDSM is a very temporary relationship, whereas this is not. So again, Milo, come on. You're better than this. Don't be fucking ridiculous. You guys can be ridiculous anywhere else on the internet. Don't bring that shit here. And open and vulnerable about it. Hmm. And that's what made the difference for me. Thank you. I, I think uh, for me, it, it's been a little bit of a challenge in, in lots of ways because we're not really taught about consent. I mean, younger people might get taught about consent, um, but I think I I got the reinforcement that I didn't have control over my body, um, uh, and that guys just because someone likes BDSM does not mean they have a mental disorder. It it was often um, told to us to you know talk to the stranger let so and so hug you you know these kinds of things um and i and i think that um i think that younger folks are getting different messages around um what they can do with their body how they can share it what's okay and what's not okay um and so i think you know i've struggled with things around consent, around boundaries, around knowing my own desire. Um, Well, because hang on. Could it be that BDSM doesn't allow for someone like an oppressor who is sexually abusing someone? I mean, I don't necessarily agree with the way you phrased it, but there is something to the fact that like, like I just said, like in a BDSM like relationship or whatever, um, like the submissive is in control. So there is something to be said for the fact that like it doesn't allow for it doesn't allow for an oppressor to exist because the submissive or like, well, I'll make that announcement in a second. The submissive is actually controlling the entire affair. Right. And so you can't have you can't have that same sort of power dynamic. But the way I'm thinking about it is like say like 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 make the analogy of um, the dom is like the bourgeois and the submissive is like the proletariat like it's it, it's very literally a dictatorship of the bdsm is a dictatorship of the proletariat that's holy shit i cannot believe we have actually reverse engineered this bdsm is a dictatorship of the proletariat because the submissive controls everything 
fascinating. Those aren't things that I was ever really taught. Um, and in fact, often taught to do the opposite, right? You don't want the peas, you got to eat the peas. Mm -hmm. You don't want so-and-so to give you a hug, you got to let so-and-so give you a hug. Um, you don't put that on a shirt bdsm is a dictatorship of the proletariat <laughs> with a whip or a riding crop i might do that i want to go to church put on the dress and go to church um and so uh, so i think for me it's been this kind of ongoing lesson I'm tweeting of, that right now of failure BDSM and um, making a mistake a dictator um, and then figuring it out of the proletariat um, kind of stumbling along and asking a bunch of questions um and then doing a lot of reading um going to workshops um i think that you know, the first thing I ever read about kink, I found under my parents' bed. Uh, we were talking about this last night uh, at, at dinner uh, in a book called Everything You've Always Wanted to Know About Sex, But We're Too Afraid to Ask. <laughs> and it was yellow, and it was a hardback, and it was a long book. You know, it was long this way and not long this way. Um, and it was weird. But every day I would go and crawl under my parents' bed. Wait. Pull that book. Out. Did someone say capitalism and did we miss it? Bot, did someone actually say cap? Did she actually say capitalism? Because I definitely didn't hear it. Do I need to rewind? Okay. So you didn't actually hear someone say capitalism is what you're saying. Uh, and and read right um and and sometimes i would ask my parents questions about what i learned but i didn't really know how to do that and and i didn't want them to know that i knew where the book was <laughs> so <laughs> i was trying not to be super specific about the detail that was in the book right um and I think that, you know, through trial and error and partners and friends, um, it, it, it's been this ongoing learning thing. I was really relating to what you were saying earlier, yo, about like being um, in romance with your friends. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that sometimes this has been a really difficult thing in relationships Tayton, thank you for the super chat. Takes me a bit to put things together. Phrasing was off, but you got what I meant. Tayton, don't apologize for the phrasing. Like this is part of what this is, is like we're thinking through this. So don't don't you don't need to like apologize for having phrased it in a, in a weird way because I get it, man. Don't worry about it. You're doing great. Because when you have a partner, sometimes figuring out how you want to interact with your friends if you don't know, if you've, if you've never been given license to say, hey, I want to do this thing with those friends, figuring out how to talk about that is kind of difficult. Um, and so I think it, it's really been about like trial and error, making a lot of mistakes, asking for forgiveness and, and trying it again. Um, and, and, and being just a little bit, um, not a little bit, a lot vulnerable to say, this, this is a thing that I want to try. I want to figure it out. I don't know the answers and I'm going to, I'm going to look. And, and I think now there's a lot more information when I when I first started, there was like two books, and and one of them was called "Screw the Roses, Give Me the Thorns," um, and it was a good book, but it was full of a lot of bad information about how to be a top, and 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 those are those are kind of lessons that I've taken into relationships, and it always it hasn't always been great, so I think it's just. Um, for me, it's just been a lot of kind of trying to learn and then unlearn and then relearn and then maybe unlearn again. Wow. 
I think you both are opening up a lot of space for people to think and consider. And um, uh, and are there any questions? I think we have time for maybe one or two questions from the audience. I think we have uh, at least one question from our online attendees that oh, okay. we're going to have one of our people here, Nina, voice. And then we will have time for one in-person question. So get your burning question ready. <laughs> Come on, capitalism, yeah, capitalism, capitalism. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Uh, so our online question, what advice do you have for someone trying to overcome some heavily instilled shame from their upbringing and background in making truly authentic art and writing on really personal themes. You know, not to be Nike, but like, just do it. You know, you gotta, you gotta try and try again and find a trusted friend who can, you know, be your accountability buddy, you know, and run it back and forth a few times. I, I want to say, yeah, they kind of are really easy to say. They kind of are really <laughs> challenging to do. However, so I, I took a, a <laughs> workshop with um, Amiri Baraka um, before he passed away. And, you know, we did the works. It was like 10 or 12 people in the workshop, but everybody would get an a individual <laughs> consultation. And when he got to me, it was like, you're trying to say something. Just say it. I dropped like, the don't cover of my slime. How were it? Don't beat around. Like, just say it. So that's what I would tell our online friends. Just say it. Just do it. So much of my life was, I am afraid to do this. I am afraid to do that. I'm not sure I, I have the wherewithal that I can make it happen. And then it would be, but it has to be done anyway. So just go and do it. Don't deny that you're scared. Don't deny that you think you can't do it. Acknowledge that, accept that, embrace that. But just go ahead and do the thing anyway. Because so what? You're going to learn something. Someone else who's encountering you is going to learn something. I came here not having a clue about what I was going to say because Non-binary doesn't speak to me as a personal attribute. But it's as I have been sitting here, I'm realizing it doesn't speak to me because I have one definition of that term. And I've been living with that definition instead of utilizing the term to expand the way I think <laughs> and actually have a non-binary thought. So you know, I'm here and I'm doing it and I'm scared out of my mind that I've said something wrong and I've offended somebody and blah, blah, blah. I'll never come to Minnesota again. Mm -hmm. And if I do, I'll never come to Minneapolis. And if I do, I'll never come to the university again. And I, you know, I, I'll deal, put it all the way down and I'll never be on this stage again and on and on and on in my head while also saying, except you did it. You got on the plane, you came here, you're in the theater, you're talking to people, they're responding. So apparently you're doing something right. Mm -hmm. It might not be stellar. It might not be anything where people are going to say, okay, but let me tell you what happened to me on Monday night. It might not be anything like that, but I know that there's going to be at least one person who's going to walk out of here thinking, I'm really happy I, I went and I'm happy I stayed and I, I'm happy I heard that thing that Yosenio said. It really, it touched me. It made me think differently about something. And if that's all that happens, then that was the greatest thing that could have happened. And I can be pleased with that. You know, being open and being out and being front and center does not mean that you always have all the answers. And it does not mean that you always do the very best of whatever that thing is that you're doing but it means that you try. And the more that you try, the easier it becomes to do it a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit, it becomes easier. And before you know it, you've hit your groove and you're doing a thing the way you need to do it and the way you want to do it. And it makes a difference. It makes people think, oh, I could do that. Or I have something like that. Or yeah, you validated what I've been thinking. It happens when you least expect it. So when you're 
challenged. I was going to say confronted, but it's it's I, that has too much of a negative connotation. If you're challenged to rise above your fears and to engage in something that could bring you some pleasure in whatever way, yes, indeed, just do it. Um, I wonder, is there a question from the audience? Uh -oh. <laughs> they're wearing masks. All right. And then so I understand in the back. not fitting in. To this very day, I say I can't invite all my friends to the same party because they won't get along. <laughs> yeah. And it's not about gender. It's not about any one thing. It's about politics or sports or it's Vikings against Packers. It's uh, Democrats against Republicans. It's a whole range of things. But I, I still live, but language is important. And I'm on a, actually a diversity and equity committee, and we are talking about language. And so words do matter. And I still live in a very white, very binary world. That means world. capitalist. Uh, and I guess most of us do, actually, when we go outside this room. And they think that, you know, if they list their pronouns, it's all good. <laughs> so, I, and I've run in, started running into problems myself. Roxanne made a comment, too, about not being trans, right? And back in the day, trans meant you were switching from one side to the other, right? And now trans means gender non-conforming. Uh, so I, 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 the question is, how do you feel like the language that we're purple creating uh, is impacting the world outside of our community? Wow, well, I think that's an, a, a powerful question. Yeah. I think it has a lot of impact on our society. Um, the language that we are creating is literally making state legislators make laws <laughs> right. against our lives. Um, what? And so that says to me that it is having a, a tremendous impact. But I think, you know, more importantly than that, I think the language is is helping people, I think just the, the identity and what's so uncomfortable about non-binary identity is that it makes people think about their own identity. And so consequently, they become uncomfortable. And like you said, you know, so, you know we have to live in that uncomfortable space but a lot of people don't want to live and so they try to legislate against it or kill you or say you can't say that right um but but clearly i think the language and we see it in in pop culture um which is the reason why there are non-binary couples on the cover of a historically, you know, sort of mono gender identity publication, um, as well as, you know, um, the Vanity Fair, or the fact that Trans Bodies, Trans Selves is in its second edition. Um, I heard it. Don't worry. I got it marked. It's is shifting the culture, and it's not always at the speed of light that we want it to but it's happening and i don't know if you just want to add to that but certainly feel free i mean i don't i don't really think so i think you know younger generations have been talking about um gender is dead for like 10 years now 12 years now mm -hmm. right and what and we are just what? kind of catching up to words like um non-binary um and so i think that you know as always young people have um have information that older folks need to catch up to and so i think younger people have been you know um neutralizing gender for quite a while. Um, and I think, you know, people that are a little bit older are still 
trying to catch up. I just wow. had a conversation uh, with a friend yesterday who who asked me who on the panel was real. Uh, Hang on. And they, they didn't mean that in... I was just going to mark this and go back and do it later, but I want to get this whole thing in a clip. I just, I like, it's just really good. Like, like the, the, the way the question was asked in terms of like, uh, what did they say that trans was about being gender non-conforming? Let me see. Trans, right. Trans meant that you were switching from one side to the other. I know trans. And then they say trans means gender non-conforming. Okay. Let's start there. their pronouns it's all good <laughs> so I, and i've run and started running into problems myself roxanne made a comment too about not being trans right and back in the day trans meant you were switching from one side to the other actually right? no. hang on hang on hang on sorry i wanted to get this without the captions being on sorry redo and they think that you know if they list their pronouns it's all good <laughs> So, I, and I've run and started running into problems myself. Roxanne made a comment too about not being trans, right? And back in the day, trans meant you were switching from one side to the other, right? And now trans means gender non-conforming. Uh, so I, 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 the question is, how do you feel like the language we're creating uh is impacting the world outside of our community wow i think that's an, a, a powerful question yeah i think it has a lot of impact on our society um the language that we are creating is literally making state legislators make laws <laughs> right. against our lives um and so that says to me that it is having a, a tremendous impact. But I think, you know, more importantly than that, I think the language is, is helping people. I think just the, the identity and what's so uncomfortable about non-binary identity is that it makes people think about their own identity. And so consequently, they become uncomfortable. And like you said, you know, so, you know, we have to live in that uncomfortable space, but a lot of people don't want to live. And so they try to legislate against it or kill you or say, you can't say that, <laughs> right? Um, but, but clearly, I think the language and we see it in, in pop culture, um, which is the reason why there are non-binary couples on the cover of a historically, you know, sort of mono gender identity publication, um, as well as, you know, um, the Vanity Fair, or the fact that Trans Bodies, Trans Selves is in its second edition. Um, the language is shifting the culture and it's not always at the speed of light that we want it to, but it's happening. And I don't know if you just wanna add to that, but certainly feel free. I mean, I don't, I don't really think so. I think, you know, younger generations have been talking about um, gender is dead for like 10 years now, 12 years now, mm -hmm. right? And and we are just kind of catching up to words like um, non-binary. Um, and so I think that, you know, as always, young people have, um, have information that older folks need to catch up to. And so I think younger people have been, you know, um, neutralizing gender for quite a while. Um, and I think, 
you know, people that are a little bit older are still trying to catch up. I just had a conversation uh, with a friend yesterday who, who asked me who on the panel was real. Mm. And they, they didn't mean that in, in, you know, this panel, this okay. panel. Um, and, and it, and it wasn't really meant to, you know, to, to be um, insultive, but I took it that way and I snapped a little bit um, and then had to remember that, you know, not everybody has the same language that I have. And so my response was nobody on the stage is Pinocchio. <laughs> We're all real people. Um, but like, what is it that you actually mean? Are you talking about gender assignment at birth? Because if that's the case, I guess nobody's real uh, because none of us really conform to the gender that we were assigned at birth. Um, but if but you're talking, oh yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> right? But if you're talking about us as humans, then like let's think about the language. And so the way that you would say that is da 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 da, right? Because this person didn't have the language. Um, and so I think while language is problematic in so many ways, we also have to have some, we also have to have some information that matches the language, right? Language is informing policy. Language does inform how we make decisions about what even we want to wear. Um, and so I think figuring out the commonness around language is really, really important. Um, and Paul, I just really appreciate the, the way that you asked that question and the way that you framed it. Um, I'm going to probably be thinking about that for a while. So just really thank you for formulating a really great question. And on that note, I'm noticing the time is 9 p.m. I, I guess that's that, it. You know, staff and work. I guess that's it. Well, we didn't get a capitalism today, but, you know, we don't always get it. We just get it like, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the time, but that's okay. We got a couple uh, great clips from the presentation today. We learned uh, why BDSM is the kink of choice for the queer community, which I think is valuable information. And I really hope for everyone who made it through the whole thing, I really hope that this was a lesson to, like, not jump to conclusions about this stuff. because. You know, guys, like, I, I really do mean this. Like, if we want to hold ourselves up as being better and ahead of everyone else on the internet on these topics, then jumping to the easy answer is not ever going to be the right decision because everyone else on the internet is jumping to the easy answer. Right? Peyton, thank you for the super chat. Queer BDSM is an act of decentering normativity in pursuit of liberation. No, 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 no. Fucking hell, Tayton, no! <laughs> you cannot... Tayton, I cannot fucking believe you're making me say this again. At least you paid me to say this, I guess. You cannot say that BDSM is decentering normativity when Fifty Shades of Grey was a resounding success on every single measure, which makes it norma fucking tivity. I cannot, I seriously cannot believe you did that to me. I seriously cannot. I can't. I fucking can't. I fucking can't. BDSM is about getting off on discomfort. They get off on discomfort. It is a dictatorship of the proletariat because the sub is always in charge. It is not about norm, norma fucking tivity. It was a way that they could get sex without coming out as gay because, because you don't always have sex when you're going like, I, I don't want to review all this. We did it all earlier for like half an hour. All right. That's all I have for today. I hope that we come back and everyone is smarter tomorrow. 
than they were today. I'm not, guys, seriously though, be fucking better. If we aren't going to be better than everyone else on the internet, then what are we doing? The whole point of this is to be better. You guys are smart. And Jason's getting timed out again. Jason, you do that shit to me again, and I will ban you again. I'm not even fucking around. I am truly not even fucking around anymore. Unfucking believable. Truly and sincerely. Unfucking believable. All right. So I guess we're leaving on the note that my chat is still fucking retarded and no one is listening and no one wants to be better. All right. Well, on that note, I'm going to go. I'm going to go grab some dinner and do other work. And perhaps you guys will come back tomorrow and be smarter than you were today. I sure as shit uh, hope so. Take care, everyone.